So I'd just like to call up the first speaker to say some welcome remarks. I shall call Tulani Dube. He's a lecturer in the Business Studies Department at Cornerstone Institute. Morning. Um, happy to see all you guys turned up today. I'm humbled that you guys showed up. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the members of the board, the CEO, um, faculty, staff, and the speakers who are here today. Um, I'd also like to thank them personally for taking time to time off their busy schedules. I know Uwu Sis Sinzi, when she walked in, she was like, this was really not on my calendar at all. Uh, thank you, Mom, Mom Jane, for, for taking the time out to do this. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all the other speakers that Uwu Ayanda mentioned as well. And um, for me, it's, it's quite humbling to see women and men at such events because we need to, as we draw from, from the talks or the knowledge that these leaders bring, it, it's, it's how we can build a truly holistic system of empowerment. So we, we shouldn't really work in silos, which is why we, we set out to have 10% men in here. So the empowerment needs to be holistic. And um, again, I just want to Sorry, I just want to acknowledge the Black Management Forum for partnering with us on this event. Um, it's greatly appreciated. And uh, I will not take up much, time, much of your time as this, is, this, this day belongs to, to the women who are here to impart their knowledge. Uh, I just want to acknowledge Rudy Bass and just give him the platform just to welcome you from a, a more higher up <laughs> institutional level, as I welcome you from a just departmental structure, but um, thank you. Good morning. Well, our perspective is that, you know, the dean is lower down, not higher up. We support our, our, our teams. So I arrive here hesitantly because this is a women's event. <laughs> and I arrive here hesitantly because most of our students at Cornerstone are women, and most of our lecturers are women, but most of our management are men. <laughs> and I offer an apology for that. <laughs> We're working at it, CEO. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'd like to read you a poem that you would be familiar with, I assume by Maya Angelou, written in 1978. There is a video of this poem, two videos that you should see. The one is by Maya Angelou herself, uh, on YouTube, you'll find it, um, and one by Serena Williams, that you might be familiar with. It's about, the, it's the poem, Still I Rise. And I read it hesitantly, because the experiences that speak to is not mine, as a male. I can't sort of, there's some perspectives I can share, and that's important because in her video of this poem, she says this goes beyond the typical categories of boundaries that we set for ourselves, race, gender, and so forth, but still allow and indulge me the nuances that I might put to the poem. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trot me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still, I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard, cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. 
Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? <laughs> Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide. Welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of a slave. I rise. I rise. I rise. Welcome. It's a privilege to have you here. Thank you. Tulani and uh, Rudy, thank you for that welcome remarks. And Rudy, please do not feel scared. We welcome your presence. And I love the poem that you just said because it reminds each and every one of us that as a woman, we go through so much adversity, yet we still rise. And may we continue to rise. And may we use today as a platform to lift each other and make sure that we all rise together as one. Now I'd like to introduce our, new, our next speaker who will say a few words on behalf of the sponsor and the partner for today's event, Black Management Forum. I'd like to call upon Yanela Mvana, the Deputy Provincial Chairperson for the Black Management Forum, Western Cape. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, to our hosts, um, the Cornerstone Institute, and to all our guest speakers, and uh, in true BMF's tradition, all protocols observed. Firstly, out, uh, my name is Yonela, as Ayanda is uh, indicated. I am the deputy chairperson of the Black Management Forum in the Western Cape. And in my other life, I am an attorney and a director of the firm Vana and Associates Incorporated. On behalf of the BMF, I would like to express our sincere uh, gratitude and excitement in having been invited uh, by Cornerstone to partner with them in this great initiative. And on, I say this also on behalf of our other sponsor, which is Coca-Cola. It truly is one of the greatest initiatives which the BMF Western Cape has had privilege and online being part of. <clears throat> now the BMF this year celebrated 41 years of its, of its existence. And key amongst our mandate is managerial leadership and development, and also the achievement of socioeconomic transformation. Now one fails to properly mention these two concepts in the absence of mentioning the word women. And I say so because the significant role and contribution which has been made into our current discourse and to the attainment of our democracy by women remains one of the most unspoken or undervalued contributions. Now, the speaker who spoke before me also mentioned the fear that he had in terms of taking up too much time you know, in speaking about women when this event is meant to be for women. Now, the role and contribution of women in South Africa dates back as far back as 1955, when women, led by many others, took to the forefront and protested against the unjust and unequitable society that we found ourselves in at that time. Currently today, the role of women, even though enshrined or protected in many of our legislation, including our constitution, remains far to be desired. Again, on behalf of the BMF, we would like to take this opportunity in wishing you the best 
in your deliberations. We understand that today South Africa is faced with many challenges of which we believe if women had been at the forefront of our leadership and we had allowed as men women to take their rightful place in society we would have far less problems than we have currently. <laughs> Without taking much of your time, I would like to wish you the best in your deliberations. I'm sure that the wealth of wisdom and knowledge that our speakers possess and our panelists today have to share uh, will obviously bring about much change in our country, which is much needed at this point. Again, we'd like to thank you on behalf of Coca-Cola and BMF and wish you the best of luck in your deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nella. There's a story I need to tell about um, BMF, as also, I'm also part of BMF. I'm the chairperson for the Century City branch. And I'm, thank you. <laughs> and I must commend BMF on one thing. So last year, we all went to the national conference. And once a year, we get a chance to amend the MRI for the BMF nationally. And as a Western Cape, we posed one thing. Because most of the time, when you look at the chair and deputy position for all provinces and national, you see that they're both occupied by men. So we took a stance to say, we want to put in writing in the MRI that if a chairperson is male, the deputy has to be female. But if the chair is female, the deputy can still be female. And that was passed <laughs> last year. <laughs> And I think that was quite a progressive step um, on behalf of the Western Cape branch. It just shows how forward thinking they were and how inclusive they are. And I must say that our branch has both female in deputy and chairperson position. <laughs> so thank you, Yonela, for your leadership in that. Thank you. Now, to kick off the program. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who's our opening act. <laughs> now, our next speaker is Jane Raffaelli. Now, I need to read this CV. I read it twice last night, and I had to take some water breaks as well. It's quite an impressive CV, Jane. There's a few things that you need to explain here. I'll ask you about them later. So after graduating from the London School of Economics in 1958 with a BSc in Sociology and Economics, Jane Raffaelli, born Mullins, won a Rotary Foundation Fellowship to further her studies at Columbia, Columbia University in New York. Jane moved to South Africa in 1960, the year of the Sharpeville Massacre, British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan's wind of change speech to the South African Parliament, and the acceleration of the process that would eventually lead to a change of government. After a stint in the advertising and PR world, she was invited to join NASPAS as founding editor of the first English woman's magazine in the company Fair Lady in 1965. She set up Jane Raffaelli and Associates in 1983 with her husband Michael Raffaelli and business partner, sorry if I pronounced this wrong, Volker Kunel, to launch Cosmopolitan magazine in 1984. The wholly owned House and Ledger and several other international titles followed, including the only edition of O, the Oprah magazine outside the US, which was hailed as a publishing coup of the decade in 2002. Jane is the recipient of numerous awards for professional and humanitarian achievements, having played a pivotal role in magazine publishing and female empowerment in South Africa. Now, let me read this long list of highlights in Jane's career. 1958, BSc Sociology and Economics, London School of Economics. 1958, Rotary Foundation Fellow, Cheshire, UK. 1958, Columbia University Rotary Fellow. And in the US, she wins $12,000 on Name That Tune. Jane, you need to explain how you spent that money. <laughs> 1959, returns to the UK at, for the Bolton Evening News. 1960, moved to South Africa. 1960, copywriter for Van Zell and Robinson and a columnist for Cape Times. 1961, copywriter, account executive, Bernstein Wilson. 
1962, opens PR division, Bernstein Wilson. 1965, she launches Fair Lady. 1984, she launches Cosmopolitan. 1988, revamps Femina and takes it over from Republican Press. 1989, Cosmopolitan Fashion Directory launched. 1993, House and Leisure launched. 1998, Brides and Homes launched. 2000, Baby and Me launched. 2002, Oh, the Oprah Magazine essay launched. 2003, Marie Claire moves to Associated Magazines. And 2011, Gold, Good, Keep it, Good Housekeeping, Queer Hosts. Holding, I hope I got that right, <laughs> launched. <laughs> wow, Jane, I wonder where you found all that time to launch that many magazines. She also has won several awards. 1986, Business Woman of the Year. 1986, Media Innovator of the Year. 1986, Star Woman of Our Time. 2000, Print Media Essay Fellow. 2001, Rapport Prestige Women's Award. 2008, NASPAS Order of Tafelbach. 2008, Vodacom Journalist of the Year Lifetime Achievement Award. And 2008 as well, Advantage AdMag Awards Lifetime Achiever Award. She has seven grandchildren who all live in Cape Town. And when I spoke to her, she said she'll never leave Cape Town. She loves it too much, doesn't miss the UK at all. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Please welcome her as she comes up to give her address on building and growing a substantial social economic ecosystem through women empowerment. Thank you, Jane. I sometimes wonder who they're talking about. <laughs> I, I haven't been able to resist taking this opportunity to talk about something that is not conventionally the kind of subject that perhaps you would expect. But thank you for the invitation to deliver this keynote address. It's not the first time that women have gathered in South Africa to debate ways of helping each other to overcome the age-old realities of a woman's life. To name a few, fertility and the family responsibilities that come with that, prejudice, financial backing, training, I'm very happy to be here today in an institution that has addressed and is addressing training as one of those important pillars without whom nobody achieves anything. But this is the first time that we have come together at the precise moment that women all over the world are not crying out, but shouting out about a much bigger and more pervasive problem. Sexual harassment in the workplace and the possible effect that this has had on female performance and female appointment to key positions, which has led to the ongoing inequity of men and women in the executive ranks, and therefore to an ongoing systematic disempowerment of women in power. Last Saturday, on Quest Means Business on CNN, Gloria Aldred, a discrimination attorney in the US, I don't think we have any discrimination attorneys here yet. That could be one resolution that one takes today. Talks about sexual harassment in Hollywood and how it is harmful to women seeking employment and interferes with their right to seek employment. Fear, she said, is a weapon that keeps women down. Lack of money also. 
People who don't have money don't have power. Trump openly confessed to the same thing and still got elected. Before him, Bill Clinton had sex with a White House intern and got away with it. In South Africa, President Zuma managed to get himself acquitted of rape charges against the daughter of his friend, along with all the other crimes he has committed against this country. In all these cases, it was the victim's problem, not theirs. It was a societal issue, not an acknowledged crime with clearly defined punishment for the perpetrator. And right now, we are witnessing women all over the world using the weapon of our time, which does not require money, hashtag me too, indicting sex offenders and demanding serious financial consequences for their crime. For the first time, men themselves, and I thank you for the men we have here today who have joined us to debate this issue and to turn it from an issue into action. You have men all over the world who are joining in this discourse, which is extremely good news. And they are doing, well, of course, they've got their own hashtags and they're honestly owning up to them. Hashtag it was me, hashtag I have. Any of you who've read my book, will know that from the moment I was given the opportunity to launch and edit Fair Lady and to go on to edit or manage several other women's magazines, I have been able to use these platforms to persistently expose and campaign against the oppression of women and girls. To mention a few, the Real Men Don't Rape campaign with Charlize Theron in 2000, Feminist White Ribbon Awards, Michelle Hatting's book, I Am the Girl Who Was Raped with Marie Claire, and in some cases, personal interventions like the Women Demand Dignity marches, helping Louise Vainant to get Marius Franzmann sacked. My book, also explains why my own early life in the north of England exposed me to the reality of sexual abusers. Though, thanks to my mother's constant warnings and good advice, I was able to evade them physically. I drove off one actual attacker by the loudness of my screams. They were caused not by fear of him, but by fear of my father's fury if he succeeded. And, and when I eventually settled in South Africa in the year that Sharpeville happened, I knew exactly what was going on here between men and women because I could read it on their faces and read it in their voices, and hear it in their voices. In some cases, like the policeman who was raping a woman in the cells just below my flat in Claremont, I was able to force his colleagues to get rid of him, in that place at least. Again, by the loudness of my complaints, I used to stand on a box against the wall which abutted the police station and scream at them more loudly than she was screaming. And years later, I met a young man somewhere and he said 
He also lived in that block of flats where I lived. And he said he and his parents used to watch me go down there and get on that box and start screaming. And his parents said, it's only a matter of time before the police come and get her too. And I must say, I didn't even think about that. It's amazing how effective a woman's voice can be and how dangerous silence is. Look at what Lion Mama has achieved in this year of active activism. As M. Ngoro wrote in the Sunday Times letter page on Sunday, Lion Mama has done a great job by reminding the court of private defense. She acted with precision and determination. She showed more intelligence than some police except for stabbing the assailant trying to flee through the window. She should only have cut his silly organ off. And if confronted by the court, explained that she did not intend to harm the victim, but to hand it in as evidence in court. Every one of us in this gathering today has a loud and powerful voice. I would like to think that the reason for us coming together is to raise these voices so loudly and so powerfully that they resound in other people's ears and start a clamor that cannot be silenced or stopped. As Aldred says, this story can't be silenced any longer. And as we are seeing on every media platform, it is everywhere. I would like to take this opportunity that you have given me to put it on our agenda for today, to use our voice and our voices and our collective power to frame a call for actual action in this country across the business board in South Africa to change the workplace so that complainants can be made safe from retaliation. Companies where this is happening will be made to suffer serious financial consequences. Heads of companies where this occurs will be held personally responsible. Today we could and should create a network of powerful women and men in this country who say to others, we have your back, we believe you, and we will do something about it. Thank you for your time and attention. And thank you, I hope, for the action that will arise from this meeting today. Jane, I just want to say thank you for your bravery. I don't know how many of us would have screamed and shouted like that and risked our own lives to at least make yourself be heard and try and make a change. So I just want to say to every one of us, I hope that we all somehow, some way, find that bravery inside of us because it can sometimes be scary and anything could have happened to you. So thank you. And thank and may it all be a lesson to us that our voices do matter. They are powerful. And it's time that we work together to change our country because we are the ones who are going to help each other. We cannot rely on anyone else but ourselves. So thank you so much, Jane, for those words. And thank you once again for your bravery. I'd like to call upon our next speaker, Cindy Hess, 
She'll be um, talking on the need of to empower and nurture women in corporate South Africa and business. Just to go through Cindy's bio, Cindy is currently the Chief Financial Officer of Media24 within the NASPES Group. She qualified as a Chartered Accountant in 2001. She joined Media24 as Group CFO on the 1st of November 2016 after spending nearly three years at Pioneer Foods, which is a listed FMCG company with a market capital capitalization of over 40 billion rand, a national footprint, strong export business and international operations in several African countries and the United Kingdom. During her time with Panya Foods, she was nominated for the CFO of the Year Award in lieu of the finance transformation work undertaken during her tenure. The finance function at Panya Foods was transformed from completely decentralized and traditional finance functions to transactional areas of excellence in finance, shared services, remuneration, and corporate finance. Robust corporate reporting and business intelligence with commercial teams at divisional level. Prior to this, she was Group Financial Director and CFO of Sea Harvest, a vertically integrated and now listed fishing company. During her career, she has been responsible for financial strategy, managing the full finance function from reporting, payroll, treasury, and working capital management, and overall financial performance, IT, procurement, internal audit, risk management, in, in enterprise risk management, combined assurance and insurances, and investor relations. Cindy was part of the key management which orchestrated a brimstone-led leveraged buyout of Sea Harvest from the Tiger Brands Group. Cindy serves on various boards, committees, and other affiliations that include Pioneer Foods Board of Directors, Media24 Board of Directors, Novus Holdings Board of Directors, Company Secretary and Public Officer for various Sea Harvest Group companies, Trustee of various employee benefit funds, retirement and medical, Audit Committee Member for Vuna Fishing PTY Limited, Director and Audit Committee Chairperson, Sunderland Marine Africa, SICA Member of Examinations Committee, IRBA Member of Investigations Committee. She has participated in mentoring and motivational talks for African Women Chartered Accountants, SICA trainees, newly qualified Chartered Accountants, as well as a National Youth Development Agency. Cindy has two daughters and lives in Iranyazif, Cape Town, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome her because she's also my mentor. <laughs> so it's great to read her CV. <laughs> Please welcome Cindy. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to Lani Ayanda for the opportunity to address this crowd of young women who are investing in themselves and embarking on a journey which can be daunting but very exciting and very rewarding. And if in a small way I can share with you my learnings, um, that gives me much joy. So I had to look up the definition of empowerment in preparing for my portion of the agenda and interestingly enough, I first thought, am I empowered? And when did that happen? How did I get there? The definition for empowerment is authority and power given. And I had to reflect on that and say, perhaps it was taken by me because no one was going to give it to me. So when did that happen? When did I become fearless? And I think it started with a fear of failure and then just a need to succeed and achieve. But that's also a journey. So I'm going to start with saying I am empowered. Yes. Um, and this was a journey. I started right where you are, and that was deciding that I had to invest in myself and that I had to learn, learn, learn. I had a family who believed that education changes 
your potential, your future and so it wasn't actually an option for me. I had to get a degree. My mom didn't care what it was in as long as I graduated and fortunately my father knew me better than I knew myself so he said you will become a CA. Um, not easy for someone who's a first generation professional um, not knowing what it is you're actually embarking on. What I want to say to you is that this is just the beginning and I think it's tougher for you than it was for me 20 years ago, unfortunately 20 years ago, when I too started and was where you are. The learning curve gets steeper, the rate of change is great. The disruption is great. You can so quickly become irrelevant. I find myself on the job at seven in the morning deciding what are the priorities for the day. I find myself still at work having achieved whatever I needed to deliver for the day and somewhere between six and seven, when most women are at home, let alone my male peers who left at five, sorry guys, it's a reality, you have a better work-life balance than most of us women in the working world. I find myself online researching topics looking up and learning about whatever I'm going to be facing over the next week, whatever's come up in a meeting, in a presentation, it's continuous learning. And the fortunate part is that everything's available. Now here's the unfortunate part. If you don't develop that mentality now and that behavior, you can become irrelevant. Some of the smartest finance people that I've had in a room on any particular project have been non-financial people. Technology and the internet has leveled the playing fields. You can study almost anything online and most of the time for free. It's the best thing that's happened in our lifetime. But for you, that means something. You can't just get the certificate at the end of your course and then think, okay, well, that is the ticket to success. It's ongoing. I'm 20 years. Um, probably 15 years as a CFO, 20 years um, in finance, and I still haven't even scraped the, the tip of the iceberg. So ongoing learning is key. If you're not learning, if you're not growing, you're dying. Be inquisitive, that's empowering. Want to learn. Ask questions, be present in every forum, whether you're doing a project at Varsity or whether you're sitting in a meeting at work, be present and inquisitive and learn every day. It's not just when you're up for promotion or a, re a salary review, learn every day. I think what's very important, so it was learn, learn, learn. If you're not growing, you're dying. It doesn't end. What I needed to learn, and I must declare that it is not easy out there and it's not easy to succeed in business. Some corporates have no, co no soul. Some people around the table are conflicted with the values of the company. But when you're in finance, you should always be the last man standing. You should be the pillar of integrity, uncompromised. So how do I deal with that? I decide long before I find myself in a situation, what do I stand for? Because if I don't know what I stand for, I will fall for anything. I, and it sounds insane, but you will learn these skills as you go through life. Don't be a victim of surprise. Think through what you will do in different scenarios, how you will react. And for heaven's sakes, don't be emotional. I learned that later in life. I become emotional about everything. And that's the first thing that gets put under the spotlight rather than the principle and the matter at hand. Draw your line early. No right from wrong. There's no gray. The difficult decisions is between wrong and less wrong, and there are some of those decisions you have to make. But right and wrong, you can't confuse. Decide what you stand for, and for me it was always, I am employed by the shareholders of the company. What's in their best interest, not in the interest of management, the share scheme, your short-term incentive, your objectives, set yourself and your peers strong goals and then go out as a team and achieve them. 
and decide very early what price you're willing to pay and at which point you will be willing to walk away. Because at some point in your career, you'll have to stand for something and that may very well mean walking away from a lot. So draw your line, know what you stand for, learn, learn, learn. It's halfway to your empowerment journey. Find your passion and purpose, not a job. When you love what you do and you know why you get up every day, you will be a force to be reckoned with and you will keep your eye on the ball and you won't sweat the small stuff. Sometimes that why and that purpose is bigger than the, the company. You will hear a lot of people saying, look after your customers because you'll look after your staff because your staff will look after your customers. You may be very passionate about what it is, the solution you bring to the market. For me, my passion was I've been given an opportunity that I take, very, I take very serious. I've been given the opportunity to study. I've been given wonderful opportunities to work in wonderful companies. I show up every day, but the main driver was I need to provide for my goals. And that quickly turned, and so everything was around how am I responsible, how do I build myself, how do I teach my goals what I stand for. And that quickly morphed into I lost my train of thought. Um, Your yeah, passion and purpose is quite clear here. Yeah? I'm okay, 42 is a, uh, older than I look. <laughs> um, and, and for me, it wasn't so much initially around the customer and the consumer and the company's brand, but really how do I provide for my family and how do I spoil my loved ones, people near and dear to me? So, you know, you don't get to where you are without support. They're not going to empower you, but they're going to support you. And it gives me much joy to be able to use the rewards of my success to spoil the people and provide the, for the people around me. I think a big thing that I'm known for and that also I stand on quite firmly and quite proudly is build your personal reputation. Do people remember you? I think I must have had four great companies on my CV in my career. Do they remember you for someone who was consistent, who always outperformed, who could be trusted to get the job done, always got the job done, never got involved in the politics, in the noise, in the confusion. Stayed out of the smokers club and the wine club, the mafia, I call them, and they're all over. They just drain and sap your energy. Don't be known to be part of that crowd. Stand out. You don't need to be popular. You need to be effective. So how, how have I grown? I, I was known, this reputation I had is I don't walk away from a fight. And that's very tiring. I now know which battles to pick. Those are the ones I can't afford to lose. And above all, I'm known to always do the right thing. There's no right way to do the wrong thing. A big part of empowerment is using the very financial skills that you're developing here to enable a successful career in your personal life. So be productive, be industrious with your, finance, with your personal finances. There's nothing worse than being beholden to a job and a boss. It will impact your judgment. If you have to go back to work every day, know that the company's not performing, the wrong decisions are taking, but you actually can't say anything because you need your job. It's one of the most disempowering realities for women especially. Um, so, so what did I do? Very early in my career, I created a fuck you fund. Six months salary. And you know, that fund has had to grow with my needs and my living expenses. <laughs> 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 
but I can't tell you how that has given me the power to assert you don't always need to dip into it because you walk, but you know that you don't need the job. You can afford to stand up for the right things. You're not beholden to a job. You are finance professionals, soon to be. There's no excuse for you not to have such a fund very early in your career. Plan your finances, set money aside, be industrious with your spare time. I love buying fixer-uppers. My daughters can't understand. They refuse to go and look at some of the properties that I, I, I buy. Like, mom, how are you going to turn this project around? And I do that in my spare time. I made more money in my personal capacity than I made in my career, and I've been very blessed in my career. I'm encouraging you to learn that early, be industrious. I think one of the most important factors of a leader, of a good leader, and someone who is powerful in every situation is someone who has emotional intelligence. But emotional intelligence starts with you. Know yourself first before you want to tell someone else where they can improve. Self-awareness is key. Know your strengths and your weaknesses. If communication is not key, I'm not, a, I'm not a extrovert. I've had to learn to pretend to be one. So it's hard for me being here today. My family is not like this. My mom was a teacher. She just shouted at everyone. So this is not a skill that I was ob observed within my family and in my life experiences. I've had to force myself to be present and to be effective in how I engage and how I listen. Sometimes I'm already always listening to what I think the person's going to say. And very early, if you, if you master that, if you listen more than you talk, you engage more effectively and you win better. Keep an open mind um, when you're dealing with people in tough situations. Anticipate where they're going to come from. And then the, the winning solution is not you being right and them being wrong, but did you engage and convince them and pull them over the line? Know your limits is also part of self-awareness. You can come to work like I did this morning. Tough Exco, I'm running back to after this, quite stressed about it. Um, and I had the talk. And we lost our Yorkie as we were reversing out the driveway. Not dead, just disappeared, she's naughty. But that was some draw, drama this morning. So I had to reboot, instead of going straight to to office, because I probably would have snapped at someone, I just went to sit in a quiet coffee shop. You need to understand that everything in your life impacts your ability to be effective at work. Be aware of that. It could be a health concern. It could be a relationship issue with your partner. It could be a whole host of things. Be aware of what you bring to work. And when you're more aware of it, you can control it better. We're not asking anyone to be perfect. I'm a certainly not, but I can always be more perfect than I currently am. You, you spend most of your adult life at work, so you need to be happy because it's also that experience and that fulfillment that you take home. So don't underestimate how the right environment and culture impacts your overall life. And I've had to make, I've had to look at that critically several times, saying, Cindy, is this the best person you're going to be? Is this the best learning you're going to have in this particular environment? Is it good for you? And I'm always looking at the next three years, saying, is this the steepest learning curve I can have? It's never been about pay or about shares or anything. It's really around what is a healthy environment and a healthy culture for me where I can grow and learn the most and be the best that I can be so that when I do go home after seven, it's a good experience. I can sit and unwind. I can sit with my kids and plug in and leave and know that I've served a good day. I've achieved what I need to do. I'm valued and respected and I'm part of the team. And that just adds to me as a woman, because I am also a mother, on top of that, a, a single mother. So I think in closing, maybe just remind you that it was learn, learn, learn. Draw your line early. Know what you stand for. There's no right way to do the wrong thing. Find your passion and your purpose, not just the job. Build your reputation. Build trust 
and a track record. Be responsible with your finances for me is probably the number one. Know yourself in every situation, how you react and how you should react to get the right outcomes. And above all, be kind and be generous and be thankful for the people who support you on this journey. But take your empowerment. Don't wait for someone to empower you. Okay, thank you. Cindy, I think with everything you told us, you can put it into like a self-help book for every woman here. <laughs> Thank you for all of that advice. I hope you guys were able to write it down. I got a few points as well in my notebook that I will treasure and keep with me. But thank you for all that advice. I'm sure we all learned a lot. And remember, empowerment starts with you. If you missed the first session, you really did miss out, but don't worry, it's about to get heated all over again, okay? Um, I think we can all agree that this, this session is more than just a talk show. It's not a platform for us as women, for lack of a better word, to whine, but it's actually a platform for us to be empowered. And I liked what um, Jane said. She said, within us, there is the voice. We have the inherent voice within us to be heard. And I think after this session, we are to exercise that voice. We are to scream loud to be heard. And I liked what Cindy said as well. She said she is empowered. And I think it's a confirmation or affirmation that each and every one of us here today will have to say we are empowered. Because no one really is going to empower you if you do not empower yourself. Um, it's not about me. It's about the panelists that I'll be calling out just now. Um, I'm going to start with Zinzim Golodela, who is a director uh, for corporate affairs at Woolworths. <laughs> and Unatim Jokweni, the head of transformation at Engine. And Lera Domgilana, who is the chairperson for Business Women Association of South Africa. I actually wanted to sit down as well. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Um, this topic is very powerful. Women empowerment rode ahead in comparison to the current state. As you heard, the current state, there's a lot of things happening. Hashtag men are trash, hashtag me too. Um, we even see women in leadership. There's always things that are just happening. And I'm gonna ask our panelists, what does the topic mean for them? Um, what, does, what does it mean? What is empowerment for you in your respective sectors? Sassinzi, I'm gonna start with you. The mic. Hello. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, interesting, um, I think, topic all the time, always for me. Um, when I was invited to this, I think I was even given a further brief to talk about entrepreneurship. <laughs> And I always duck that topic generally, um, entrepreneurship and women, because it boils down to one thing for me and nothing else, being ourselves right from the beginning and knowing ourselves as women, entrepreneurs, and it also ends with knowing ourselves. But I prepared uh, something al around this topic specifically. And based on my work, I think, in the transformation space over the years, I've kind of put out a challenge that we should have had, um, in terms of policy, we should have had a what I call BWEE. -E. 
Instead of Black Economic Empowerment, we missed W. And a further challenge, and I've actually put out the challenge to the powers that be that, um, you know, what seems, and I don't want to be technical, what seems to be a 30% recognition for Black women ownership should actually be 51%. And I'm saying this with um, such confidence because I've seen how women have taken up entrepreneurship um, in a much more, uh, I'll go to the detail on how I think women have taken out entrepreneurship. So I don't think it would have been a challenge that we as women don't take up. So the comments I'm going to make, I do want to put two um, uh, things out, um, uh, um, disclaimers out. I'm biased as a woman. Um, so when I do the work, uh, I will move, do you mind moving the plant? As the, the, the photographer would uh, moan, but that's fine. I understand what your issue is. It's on the way of communication, right? Now I can see you. Um, so my bias is that I'm a woman. Uh, maybe if as a practitioner or as a man, I'll have a lot more to say. And the second, second one is that I'm not an entrepreneur. And I've actually consciously realized that I am not an entrepreneur. Having dealt with entrepreneurs uh, for years, I just know what it takes to be. So my conclusion is that I take my head off entrepreneurs and I even take my head off women entrepreneurs specifically. Um, and I started off saying knowing yourself and it's knowing myself that I realized that I don't have what it takes to be an entrepreneur in the true sense of the word. One of the things I really enjoy in dealing with women entrepreneurs is the fact that they educate themselves in some shape or form. Um, so I meet um, in my work women and men entrepreneurs, and I'm sorry I have to compare a bit. Um, and I find it always fascinating that this woman is gonna come and tell me things, and you know they've done their homework. But the guy is gonna like give it to me type of thing. I'm like, dude, you should have done your homework. You can't be asking my or Woolworth specifically to do that. You know, if you had done your homework, you wouldn't expect that. But women, they go do. Uh, they, I mean, Cindy said it. I think we we. Uh, it's very easy for us to be empowered as women and we mustn't take that for granted. Um, so we go educate ourselves. Um, not only that, they, they not, for me, the other thing that I enjoy is that they not, women generally are not scared to ask for clarity. It's not gonna come across as they stupid. You know, it's like, sissy man, tell me, how does this thing work? I'm like, now nah, I love you. You know, you've got the guy who's gonna like, mm, you're trying to explain something, they like, I know. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So I love that. Please keep that about yourselves as, as women. Um, and, and for me, particularly in the space of transformation, is that one of the issues I have with us beneficiaries of transformation is that we do not take time to understand it. So we, we can, so that we can best navigate, participate, and benefit from it meaningfully. And I think women do this best. The second one is this climbing of the ladder thing. Um, you know, this notion that people climb ladders and kick them. I find women, they, they don't only keep the ladder, but they send an elevator to fetch somebody else. They make it easy for the next person. Um, and it, what's fascinating for me is that a woman would be starting a business, but they're already wanting to pay forward even before they are paid themselves. So in their business plan, they're already thinking how they're going to help the next person, how is it going to, and I just love that about women. So, so triple bottom line, for those of you who are in business already, came about as a 
you know, a afterthought in business, that we're running business and then we need to think triple bottom line. But it seems women, triple bottom line is natural for them. You know, they think and they embed it right from the beginning and I, I just love that. Um, the third point I want to make um, is that one of the issues I grapple with as a practitioner is openness and transparency of SMMEs, you know. Um, you, you would have somebody venturing into business, but they already playing power, power games with information, you know, and and I always say that the advice and support provided to an, an entrepreneur is as good as information shared and the level of transparency. You'll have women just pouring their heart out and it's in pouring your heart out that you actually realize that your business is not working, not only, not because of a big business process, no, it's just your personality. Let's talk about your personality, Sissy. You know, and you know, do you realize that in the way you're thinking this is what it, you know, it, it does to your business? So women are easy, you know, and I love women in my office. They're just easy to go, go there and be transparent about this is not going right. This is not, you know, I don't know. I don't see this and you realize, oh, okay, that it's very easy to find advice, to give advice and give support to somebody who gives you all the information. Whereas our brothers, it's like, you know, I can't come across, I can't come across as not knowing. I can't come across that I have shortfalls. I'm like, dude, we, I don't know. I always, I don't know about you, Unat, I always have to beg for transparency. Can we sign off a principle that you are going to be transparent with me? Even when we've done that, you know, you find you have to dig, you have to find things. So I like that about women and I, th I think that's just uh, naturally how, and we're very easy to trust. And I understand the world of business is dog eat dog, but um, the level of trust in women makes them better entrepreneurs in my view. The last one, um, is the issue of networking. And it's always seen as a challenge for women. And I think it's just that um, I always wonder, you know, if I started golf, in fact, I went on a golf clinic and I was deemed a best uh, whatever, I don't know, so, somehow I swing uh, whatever. <laughs> Then I thought, <laughs> then I thought, should I do this thing? Then I worked out the hours and I'm like, oh, my kids, you know, and, um, but men network. Do we give that to men? They network. But let me tell you something about women. They connect. Yeah. The thing about women is connectedness and business needs that. You know, you, you just find, um, you just find that um, you might not have all the networks in the world, but those you have as a woman, you've connected with them. Um, I find myself socializing with the entrepreneurs in our program. The women entrepreneurs, not the men. The women entrepreneurs will go out, the other one help me find a dog. And I look at this thing and I'm like, I'm really connected to this person. Is it still ethical? Yeah, no, I'm not doing anything wrong. But it's that connectedness. As a result, anytime she has a problem, you know, she picks up her phone and call. I can't say the same with um, the, and I'm generalizing, with the men in the program. So that connectedness is something that we we given. And, um, and it, it, it really goes to the depth of deriving mutual value from a transaction because you're connected. So with the, all of the above points, I, I, I close off with what I started with. Let's know ourselves. Let's treasure who we are as women. Other than that, there's nothing. There's nothing I always uh, get asked by people. What do you do specifically for women in your program? There's nothing. All we want is women to be themselves. And, and not trying to fit in this world. Which world? This is your world as well, as an entrepreneur. And bring yourself to it and make the best out of it. We've been entrepreneurs in our homes. So what's new? But I still maintain I'm not an entrepreneur and I salute women venturing into business. Thank you.
Wow, thank you so much, Zinzi. Zinzi took us on the entrepreneurship um, point of view. And besides her is this Unati in her bio. In fact, their bios are on this program. Um, this Unati in her bio, she states that she's had um, experience in entrepreneurship before she ventured into um, Engine. Um, so I'd ask you, linking to what Zinzi just talked about from an entrepreneurship, and she did say that she's not an entrepreneur, but you were an entrepreneur and I think it's a spirit so it's still in you but you know take us through that and also transformation in our current state as a woman what does that mean in your sector wow You're taking me back to a very traumatic time of my life eh? <laughs> um, I think let me start by greeting everyone this morning and thanking Tulani for inviting us. I'm actually quite happy to be surrounded by such beautiful, um, intelligent women and, and, and I'm surrounded by greatness here, as you can see. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Unati Njogweni Magida. It's, it's, it's actually an N, so thank you, and not an M. Um, yeah, so, well, when we talk about empowerment, let's start with empowerment first. Um, I think empowerment for me is, there's so many definitions out there, but for me, it's a personal decision. It's a personal choice that a person makes. Yes, there would be so many empowerment opportunities, so many empowerment programs, even in the work, workplace, but if you as a person do not want to be empowered, you will not be empowered. So it's a psychological decision that women take. And, and, and it goes to disempowerment as well. We're currently living in a very, very difficult time, especially in South Africa, where women are being disempowered in all spheres of life. You open the radio in the morning, you will hear about some lunatic who has no power but wanting to exact his power by raping a little girl. You go into the boardroom, some man that's got no power and one is not, is not psychologically empowered or does not have confidence would want to exact his seniority on a young female through sexual abuse, through sexual favors, in order for them to get ahead. That's disempowered, the empowerment. And people who get disempowered are not only the young, vulnerable, uneducated. It happens everywhere. It happens in parliament. It happens at home. It happens at schools. It happens everywhere. So for me, empowerment is a psychological decision. And going back to my business, which I um, co-created with my husband some 10 years, 10, eight years ago, um, it was the most beautiful learning curve of my life, but the most traumatic um, learning curve um, in the sense that um, you become a hustler. There's a trait that I naturally didn't have, but I've had to learn as an entrepreneur to actually look at opportunities, target opportunities, go for opportunities, be rejected, cry at first, yell at first, undermine them at first, and think, who do they think they are? Do they know me? And you come back three months later and you think, actually, I need a business. I am actually going to humble myself and go out there and provide my service. And that is empowerment for me. The ability to make that decision, to say I'm going to forge ahead and I'm going to do it anyway. That is a psychological decision entrepreneurs take because they want what they want. They want to grow, they've got an intention, they've got a purpose. So it was, um, a very, very um, empowering um, area of my life. Uh, so many lessons I've learned there, uh, to a point that I think the company that trained me before, which was a telecoms company, um, would actually be very happy 
to see what I have become after that stint of being an entrepreneur. So entrepreneurs are bold, fearless people who are able to take rejection, who are able to go back and refine and hone back their skills and come back and bring about a better service again. So those, are, those people don't sleep. Those people are always constantly researching to make sure that they provide something different from the next person. So it is, it is a very, very interesting um, uh, phase of my life, yeah. I hope I didn't throw you off track because I do understand you prepared a speech. Did I throw you off track? <laughs> Okay, amazing. Um, so our third speaker, um, Ms. Lerato, who is the chairperson of its Business Women Association of South Africa. So I think we're very blessed to have these women here who know all sectors. Um, Sis Sinzi, although she's in corporate, she works with entrepreneurs. Um, Sis Onati, she's had experience being an entrepreneur and you hear when she's talking, she still has that entrepreneurial spirit within her. And I think that's something that she'll impart to us while we are sitting here because there's many young people here who do not just want to wake up in the morning, you know, serving another person, but they want to serve themselves or serve their community, even their country through entrepreneurship. So take um, advantage of these women that are here. But we also have Sis Lerato, who runs an association, Business Women Association, and I think she'll touch in all these points that they've spoken about this morning. Um, over to you, ma'am. Good morning, ladies, and the few gentlemen in the room. As already said, my name is Lerato Mgilana. Um, I always have identity issues. I say to people that um, I'm not a Cape Townian. I stay in Cape Town. And Pumeza always says, don't worry, you'll get used to it. But as already said, I'm an entrepreneur myself. Um, I actually have a group of organizations that, you know, if you ask me how did they come about, the one fed on the other, and as opportunities arise, you then realize there's a need for this, so you start the next one. But again, to empower myself, and it's the, the group is called Progen um, Group, and the Progen is basically my first name, Prudence, and my husband's first name, Genghis. But then, Initially, when the group started, as what happens in society, my husband assumed chairpersonship of the group, and I became the MD. And as that happened, I realized that, you know, he sits and does what men do always to us women. You know, you go out there, you search for business, and he comes back, and he sits with a yardstick and say yes, no, yes, no. And the first thing I did was, in 2009, we had a board meeting. We actually drove to the office. I remember we had breakfast at the house, drove to the office. When we got to the office, it was me, myself, uh, him, him my, myself, and the PA. And we went into this board meeting. And this man came scathing on me. And I took a decision. I'm firing the chairperson. <laughs> I'm firing him. Not only did I fire him as chairperson, I actually told him, you know what? I think as my husband, you need to also remove yourself from my businesses because it might just become very complicated for me to do business out there. You know, not a very difficult, not a very easy decision, but it happened. And I'm proud to say that so many years later, the businesses are still standing. I still consult him, by the way, the way he would consult me about what he does in life. So again, it's, it's about us, you know. As my colleagues have already said before me, empowerment is not about what law is out there, who gives what space. It's the spaces that you claim, you know. As a person, be a disruptor. Some, somebody called me a disruptor not so long ago, and I normally say I'm not. I'm, I am followed by circumstances. I say to people, when I was in high school, I wanted to be a doctor, and I passed to be a doctor. 
Then where I wanted to go to medical school, there were wars. My parents refused. What happened? I ended up in law school. It was supposed to be for a year, and thereafter then go back to medical school. But I passed, and I thought, why waste my year? So I continued in law. But I also knew that I don't want to go and represent criminals, because growing up in the township, the more violence that you hear about was not men-on-men -men violence was men against women violence. And that's when I knew that, no, that's not the kind of lawyer I want to be, you know? And with my career and all that, working in trade unions, I then ventured into organizational development and my passion for people grew. And I knew that, you know, as a, as, as a woman, one of the things that we can say we are different from our male counterparts in the boardroom and anywhere else, is we are, we are natural nurturers, you know? And people will sometimes want to tell you it's actually very disempowering as a woman to be a caregiver. It's not. It's very empowering because you know what? When they're beaten out there in the world, they come back to us and embrace, you know, that power. Embrace it and don't complain, you know. Yes, sometimes I say, God, why did you give us 24 hours? We need 25 as women because we juggle everything, you know. We, we, we sit here, we, we, then after this, you mentor, you, you are a mom, you are a wife, you know, you, you go to church gatherings where you, you play a role. So it's in those roles that you need to empower yourself. Now, coming to more structured empowerment in terms of businesses, the government out there has made laws, but we know, you know, laws can only go so far, you know, and if you are going to sit in some corner, you know, those of you that are the neck will know, but we are So sitting in some little corner out there, and this is not just to women that are in businesses, that run their own businesses, even in the corporate world. You know, I've been in, in, in corporate myself, I've been in private practice, I, I, I've run so many businesses, but I've also made sure that each and every of these businesses that I've run, I've done what my male counterparts didn't do. I have all sorts of certificates in my name, you know, because I wanted to make sure that I don't want to be told about something I don't know, you know, because that's what, as Zinzi said, you know, men never ask. They assume, and because society allows them to stand up that tall, you know, you assume they know, and they play the part. What do we do, even when you know? You don't stand up. You don't say, but you're wrong, you know? You don't say, no, you know what? I respect you, you're my husband, but I don't think you're good for my business. You're good for the way I want my business run. You make that decision, you empower yourself, you make sure, you know? You go out there, again, right now, we are living in a world that is extremely ethically challenged, you know? What does that mean for us as women, you know? It, you are going to be asked all sorts of things, you know? First of all, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you come, a man gives a proposal, he wants 100K. You give a proposal, you want 100K. They, they don't go to the man and say, do you think you can re-look at your numbers? Who do they go to? They go to the woman and they say, do you think you can re-look at the numbers? And I actually say, you know what? I actually gave you a discount because I knew you were going to ask for one. You know, so you are already at a discounted price. If you want me to go below this, then it's not worth it. You know, so that's the, that's the empowerment that you need. You know, when men, when you meet them, they very quickly stick out their hand and they say, I'm so-and-so, what do we do? Eh, uh, um, uh, you know, because that's what we are, that's how society wants us to behave. Now, I'm saying get out of that cocoon, empower yourself before everything else. The laws are there, but these laws are not going to apply themselves. And believe you me, there are people that are sitting and thinking, how do I get around these laws? You know, how do I get around? If they say 30%, you know, somebody says, no, put your sister or your daughter in the company and we can always come up with a quota of 30%. It's not a woman-owned business, you know? Or when they say it's women-owned, it's a fronting. You know, you find that the person that's actually calling the shots, it's a man, 
you know? And I'm saying to you out there, yes, there'll be a lot of nights where you will cry, there'll be a lot of times where you'll be rejected, but it's up to you to stand up, stand tall, and say, I'm empowered, not by somebody else, by my own self. You know, I'm, I'm me in my own right, I'm empowered, I know what I'm talking about, I know what I want, I'm passionate about what I'm doing, and I'm going to do it that way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sis, Una, um, Sis Lerato. Sis Inzi, and now I'm back to you. Um, in, your, in your earlier address, you talked about knowing yourself, you talk, and you explicitly said to us that you know that you're not an entrepreneur. Um, for those who don't know Sis Sinzi, um, I think in 2015, she won an award of being um, the best black manager of the year at BMF, awarded by BMF. And now she holds a very high position at Woolworths, uh, being a director of a division. And she reports to, to, to the CEO, right, Ms. Zareda? So my question to her, um, I understand she has a mindset that is amazing. And I want you to share how your thought process for someone, for a black lady, a black lady like yourself who holds a very senior position at Woolworths. And I know it's about knowing yourself. You talked about that. How does your mindset um, arrange the, the, your, you know, your thought process in getting yourself where you want to be? Can you just walk us through that? I think the notion of knowing yourself is a journey. It's not an event. Um, and I've traveled it at different um, phases of my life. Some painful, but I always want a lesson out of any pain. I think just what Unante alluded to. Um, and I always argue that, um, and I'm also very, very, oh, not very, somehow spiritual. Um, in that I believe um, anything and everything that um, has become part of my experience was for a reason. Um, from what I studied by chance, <laughs> um, I'm listening to the writer in terms of you, you do medicine and then you end up in law. I, I don't think those things happen by mistake in my spiritual realm. So that's part of knowing myself and knowing at the end of the day this basket of skills that I have. And then most important is the life purpose. Um, so I am, and I'm proudly going to say this, I'm one of, I want to believe, few people in the world. So if I say world, I think it's few. It's few people in the world who are paid to live their life purpose. So I'm content with what I'm doing, touching lives in the work that I do. I know that sometimes I look at my kids and they're going to say to me, um, Mom, you lived in the era of black economic empowerment. What did you do for us? But I know that I lived in that era for a different reason, not to be an entrepreneur, but to touch lives. And I've supported many businesses. I've started many businesses. I've, you know, I, I, and, and I go to bed and I smile and I look at people's turnovers, you know, moving from this to that. I don't need to be an entrepreneur myself. I don't have in my personality certain traits that I've observed to be key in becoming an entrepreneur. And I don't think that's a mistake. If my son is going to be an entrepreneur, I would know what to do to support him. And isn't that entrepreneur enough? So I'm a partner in a couple of businesses, but I am not an entrepreneur, and the two are different. So knowing myself also is knowing that um, I'm in a particular environment. Currently at Woolworths, I know exactly what I'm meant to do there, and it's got nothing to do with Woolworths. Woolworths um, strategy fits in my life purpose, not the other way around. Wow. When it When it doesn't fit, I look for it somewhere else. So I've defined my life purpose um, to an extent that there's some aspects of it that I've fought and fought at Woolies and I realized that 
um, I'm, I'm drained and I decided I'm going to fetch them somewhere else. So the boards I sit in, they feel a purpose. I believe in my role, for example, I should be doing diversity management. So I don't do diversity management. What do I do? I make a bigger impact in the restitution foundation in the country work in Nedlec, in so I don't have to do all of that. I think we drain ourselves thinking we know what's supposed to be instead of just knowing what you what your life purpose is and go and leave it somewhere else if where you are you can't leave it. So it's a long process. I mean I can spend a whole day talking about it. Um, it's not an event, it's a growth process knowing yourself. Well, wow, thank you so much. She does say it's a long process, and today is a long day, and she'll be here, so you can chill with her. <laughs> Sis Unati, um, you talked earlier about your journey being an entrepreneur, and you did um, say that it was a bit painful. And if those that were here earlier, they heard Cindy talk about fights, the fights, you fight and the fights you choose to walk away from. So in our area, in our era, there's a lot of people, young people, even older people that are scared to try out new things, particularly entrepreneurship because of failure. They're scared what will happen if I fail. So you went through that journey and because of whatever fight you were fighting, you decided to just fold that fight of entrepreneurship to walk into transformation in engine. And you know, in our country currently, we talk about radical transformation. So I want you, I want you to, to just empower someone out there who is looking to enter in, in entrepreneurship but scared of failure um, you know of things could go wrong but just you know just open to her you know her mindset of the doors that could open beyond you know the entrepreneurship okay um, I think you know you've just touched on what Cindy earlier said she said one of the things that made her successful was the fear of failure. And I guess I could easily identify with that because many a times, um, us as women are scared of failing. And we need to go back to understand why are we scared of failing? Is it something that has been informed by our upbringing? Is it the confidence that we were not able to get when we're young to a point that when we see failure, we see the end of the world. Whereas other people see failure as an opportunity to do it better and differently the next time. So for me, moving from an entrepreneurial environment was again a conscious decision because I knew what I wanted in life. And um, I knew that South Africa was not ready for what I was offering at the time. And I'm sure if you saw my program uh, there, I did funny things like hypnotherapy, um, energy resourcing, and I wanted to bring that into work, into the workspace space, and bring in a different way of um, improving performance for organizations through a different type of psychology which I still practice um, in my environment at Engine, which is a very male-dominated um, environment. Um, I have not lost my entrepreneurial flair. Um, one of the things I do better at Engine is to support entrepreneurs. I have the responsibility to lift as I rise. It's one of the things that you do very well or one of your mentors in the BMF. Um, funny enough, last night when I was talking to my little girl, um, Zanda, I was asking, Zanda, I'm talking to women tomorrow. What do I say to them? And then she asked, Mommy, what is it all about? And I said, it's about women empowerment. She said, just tell them that each and every one of them has a responsibility to support another woman. Thank you. Thank you on her behalf. And she also said it is one generation's responsibility to support the next. She's 15 years old. 
And um, that for me is something that I decided a long time ago, and I guess that didn't just come from somewhere, she's probably seen it somewhere um, in the house or noticed it somewhere amongst my peers. So um, it, is, it is something that, um, because I did not do it right, and I had to fold my business that I loved so much after three years of trying it, uh, because the balance sheet wasn't looking good at all. So I took all my certificates, dusted them off, and went to knock at Engine. And at Engine, God gave me an opportunity to make a difference to people like me who are aspiring businesswomen. And as a result, um, at Engine, one of the things that are not found in South Africa, that are geographically impossible to grow in this land, which is your crude oil. For decades and decades, South Africa imported crude oil from Singapore, Dubai, London, everywhere. There were no South African traders. But it took, I don't wanna say my era, but our era, that we fought to integrate South African crude trade, traders. Today, 30% of engines crude is procured from 100% black female who is exactly my age. When I look at her books, I don't know how to count those numbers. <laughs> so that's the kind of empowerment um, that we're talking about, that if you were not able to succeed, you did not fail you are given another opportunity to succeed in a different way. And that's not only her. There's so many programs that we do, that I lead at Engine, that support young black entrepreneurs, both female and male, because if you look around South Africa, leave all the negative news that sadden us every morning. But if you look around South Africa, we've got so much potential. We've got so much talent. I get inspired by the stories I hear. There's one of my programs that I love the most, which is called the Engine Peach and Polish. Um, you can Google it anytime, and I think we're going to be in Cape Town in the next two weeks. Um, yeah, Tulani, I'll, I'll send you details so that whoever wants to pursue that, they can actually come and attend. Um, that program is, is like a business idols program where, um, it's like, you know, the music idols that um, coincidentally Unati is also hosting? So, so I also have my little business program, so which is called the Engine Pitch and Polish, and we go around the country identifying those young hidden gems of talented South Africans who at any given point in time would not be given a chance to develop their business models or grow their business models. But we've taken, again, the decision to say we're going to unearth them, groom them, drill them, make them cry, make them confused, make them want to give up. But at the end of the day, when they leave there, they know what, they, what they're all about. They're confident to articulate their business. They're confident to know exactly what will make their business succeed or what will make their business fail. And we've seen so many powerful stories um, across you know, the country of young and um, strong, powerful women and men that have made decision to actually take the next step. So again, empowerment is about a personal decision and that conviction not to give up. Wow, thank you so much, Ms. Onati. Yo, guys, did you hear? We have our own idols. So if you cannot sing, enter Onati's idols. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ms. Lerato, 
reading from your bio, you are doing amazing things. In fact, you've done amazing things, lots and lots and lots of things. And currently you are studying towards your MBA, which I know it's, it requires strength, strength, strength. I want you to talk to us about work-life balance. How do you balance? How did you balance all of those? Because as a woman that you are, you are involved in a lot of things. You mentioned your, a lot of things. So can you walk us through that? As I said to you that, you know, you need to, you know, uh, both of them have said, you need to know yourself, you need to be content with who you are, and, you know, I know people normally say that you are your best competition. I've said to myself, I don't want to compete with anybody, I don't even want to compete with me. You know, I recognize my strengths and I work on them. But I've also, as I said, I've empowered myself in such a way that, you know, I've, I'm not one of those mummies that have allowed their kids to bring their homework and put it on the table and expect you to do it for them, and then they copy it. I opened my own books. When, when my son was doing his metric, I was also writing my, last, my final exams for my MBA. So I used to wake him up and he would tell me, but mommy, I'm not you. I don't study in the morning. And I said, you know, unfortunately, my child, there's going to be a time where you have to work at night, in the evenings and all of that. So it's a, it's a, it's a choice that you do as well. And you, need, you also need to know how much you can take as a person. Otherwise, you are busy driving yourself to death. You know, um, it's not an easy journey because, of course, as I say, sometimes I cry, why don't I have 25 hours? But the reality of it is you need to choose how much of a chunk can you take at any given point. Give yourself space, give yourself time, and breathe. There's nothing wrong with breathing, you know? And wanting to be superwoman, super everything, doesn't work. You will just run yourself to the grave earlier than needs be. As I also said, be passionate about what you do because then it doesn't become a chore. You know, if you find yourself in a job and you hate everything about it, I'm going to tell you now, leave. You know, sit and say, what exactly is it that I want to do? What, what drives me as a person? And take that which drives you and let that be, you know, your starting point because that's what's going to make you. You know, since this told us that She's very fortunate. She gets paid for her life purpose. That's where you need to find yourself. As a result, you will find yourself doing 100 other, people, other things, but your day still remains your day. You know, I play hard. You know, I, I'm a grandmother. I, 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 I do all sorts of things, but as I say, you know, I choose. You know, I choose, and I'm not going to try and be all over all the time, you know. And at some point, you also need to be able to say, so-and-so can do it. You know, when I was raised, I was told, you need to cook for your husband, you know. And um, my eldest daughter, uh, it, she's a chef, she's a qualified chef, but it took me a long time to actually let her cook in the house, in our own kitchen. It, 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 it always used to be mommy's space. And one day, I was actually sick. And she asked me, Mommy, can I make you food? And for the first time, it actually dawned to me, you know, I've actually paid her fees to be a chef. She, she cooks for the world, not for me. That was a rude awakening for any person, you know, because you can imagine, I'm sitting with a chef in the house, but she never cooks. She applies her trade all over, and everybody tells you how well the food looks. I, I just see pictures, never eating the food, because I was raised to, to say that my kitchen is my space. And as soon as I gave that power away, it was useless power, eh? It was very tiring power, because <laughs> after everything that I've done, you know, after everything that I've done throughout the day, I needed to run home to cook. Sometimes not even eat supper with them, run to a dinner meeting. 
But it's because that's how I was raised. I was told you cook in your own house, you know? And now, believe you me, I stay in bed and I call them. I actually send them WhatsApps. Can you, can you make me breakfast, you know? And I, I feel empowered that way because it's just freed so much time, you know? And okay, fine, ever, every Sunday, it's, I still own the kitchen, you know? Every Sunday, I still own the kitchen because I say to them, at least they need to have a proper meal once a week. <laughs> So I still discount the chef, you know, that um, the designer food that she makes us, we appreciate, but yes, we want, you know, just the home cooked mummy meal. But as I say that, you need to then say to yourself, how much can I take and how much can I do? And allow yourself space to breathe. It's, it's always good, you know, and just have me time, you know. You, you are always told that, no, if you, if you take some time out, you are lazy. No, you're not lazy, you actually need it, you know. Um, just, and sometimes you don't even have to be doing anything. Just sit, you know, just sit and wonder and, and be in Nala Land. Yeah. Just sit and wonder and say, you know what, this is me time. And nobody must ask you what exactly were you thinking about. Just say I was not thinking. And that's very healthy because that's when you, re, you actually re-energize and refocus. Wow. She is indeed superwoman. I'm standing up so that um, as an indication that it's question time. Is there anyone with a question? There should be people with questions. Is there a roving mic? There is a roving mic. Hands up. On the second row, just state your name and your question. Okay, um, good, good. Okay, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kumeza from Partners for Possibility. My question to all three of the ladies is how have you dealt with people in business who are not ready to encounter you? You being an educated black woman in a high powered position in Cape Town. How have you dealt with people who are not ready to encounter you? Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna take that. Well, um, I'll start, um, and, and I, I'm, I'm going to say to you that when I started, I said, you can't wait for the next person to empower you. And sometimes stereotypes and norms that you belong in a certain space, it's up to you to actually say, I actually do belong here. You know, um, if you are going to allow people to define which spaces you are supposed to be occupying and which spaces you are supposed to be in, then that's where the first problem starts. You know, so I'm saying that it's a free country. You know, if you think you have any, my, your rights and my rights are equal rights, you know, so you have no right better than mine to be where you think you need to be and I need to be. So for me, I, I normally say that I'm not asking for favors you know, and you don't necessarily have to like me, but um, we need to work together and we must do what needs to, to, to be done. And so focus on the goal and what needs to happen. Um, for me, um, for me, um, it goes back to empowerment. I don't know why I always choose these technical industries. Um, going into the oil industry for me at a much more matured age than I was earlier on was a bit daunting because that industry is very complex. And um, for people to accept you in their space, they need to first identify you or identify themselves in you. Remember you walk into a culture so the first thing that I found myself doing was to actually understand oil economics, yeah. understand the petroleum business, understand the culture of the organization. Don't be under pressure to deliver on the first three, five months. Don't be under pressure. Learn the trade so that when you sit around that board table, and you open your mouth, you make them turn around and say, wow, she's brilliant. And if you continue doing that, people will respect you at work, and people will accept you, not because of who you are, but for the value that you bring in business. 
And it's only after that they start realizing, oh my God, so Unati is not from Cape Town, actually, because now they can pay attention to you. But when you walked in there, you were just another affirmative action stats for economics, I mean for employment equity, a tick box exercise so that we look good on our profile. So that, what, that's what happens. But until you make a decision that I want to be respected, I want to contribute, I want to be intellectually sound on this difficult subject, can you be able to stand firm and walk tall and be proud in your heels when you walk down those passages? So ladies, it is important that when you get into any environment, learn the trade. Your empowerment and confidence is in your ability to confidently run the business in your head before anybody else can actually undermine you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how do I deal with people um, in, who are not ready to me encounter me? It depends. I have my moments. Um, <laughs> I'll use two examples, and I'm going to use my store, Woolies. Um, you know, when I shop at Woolies uh, with my kids, you know, there's, there's always this interesting, especially in Cape Town, not in Joburg, you know, that um, you treat it in a different way if you are certain. Have you experienced that? Mm. Or you have uh, my colleagues uh, uh, working on the floor, speaking Venek, and in the ultimate vulgar, you can find because they think the money is white. Ne? So my son will go like, are you taking this one or are you leaving it? <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I'm saying even in business, it depends, you know, and the airplane is the same thing. You know, introduce myself, I do transformation, eruption happens. When I don't feel like it, I don't tell the person next to me what I do because actually I don't have the energy to go there. So it's knowing yourself again, it's that energy, you know, um, do I have the energy to deal with it? So in business, I know that sometimes to create what I call a hotspot is a gift to the next person. You know, if I have got the energy to go in the hotspot, I'm an energy person, so I'll pick up that this is going to erupt. And if I'm ready for it, I'm going all the way. And somebody needs to get a gift. And there, I'll say the oddest of things. I will tell people the oddest of things. What I think, and I don't cushion it, because somebody needs to go home and think. And it has happened before. They, they SMS me at 5 o'clock and they're like, Zinzi, can we have a meeting about that thing that happened yesterday? I'm like, sure, because I know somebody has thought about it. Then there's certain instances where I'm like, okay, I get what's happening here. I get the energy. I don't have the energy. In fact, I can't lose this person in my journey. In fact, I want to convert this person into a change agent. So I can't go into an eruption and a hotspot with him, you know? Let me walk, let me meet him where he is. And I'll do strange thing. What drives him? Is he a brownie point person? I'll work with him behind the scenes to make him shine like nobody. I'll even nominate the person for a, a, a when he starts working with me, for a CEO award. And that person becomes a change agent completely. They didn't even know what happened to them. I'm a manipulator. This is the power of being a woman. Those of you who have three kids, you look at your kids and you know this one operates like that, you know. It's, you know. <laughs> but that's, that's just the skills we have, you know. And you look at this thing and you say, poor soul, okay, let me see how I can work with this one. You know? So I don't have one answer. But I've experienced that a lot of times, people not, re not being ready to deal with you. Sometimes you don't even have to say a thing, your position is an issue. You're in a meeting and they're like, what is she doing here? You know, kind of thing. Um, and you work with that energy, but very important, again, I'm going to go back to my starting point, know yourself. And know yourself at that very moment, because you don't want to go into a hot spot 
if you are not ready and have the energy for it because you must take it all the way. It could, you could think it's that person's lesson, but it's actually your lesson. Because you're not always right, you don't know where it's gonna end up, you don't know what cards this person is gonna bring up, you just have to be ready for it. That's the beauty and I love this country. I love this country because I don't think you'd experience that much in any other country, you know? And it happens everywhere, it's not just in business. I'm on a hotspot thing with a school now. You know, and I had to make a choice and I'm going all the way. I'm going all the way because hell no, we can't have our kids, we can't assume our kids are sorted and we're breeding what the schools currently are breeding. So I'm going all the way, you know. So whether it's in school or in business or at a shop floor, Please take on those Woolies uh, uh, shop assistants. They can't, you know, they can't because all of a sudden a man came. They, they're like, okay, they don't even say I will be with you. And I think it's better in Woolies than in any other uh, retailer. <laughs> just, so, so, so I must just say that. You know, they would like leave you to attend and like, hang on. Uh, <laughs> why did you leave this one to attend to this one? They will leave you to attend to the man and maybe the man looks good. <laughs> I don't know, you know. So everywhere you are, check your energy, know what to up for, go for it. You go in, you go for it. Wow. Can we take another round of questions? Maybe three people, three or four people, yes? Yeah. Another. Hi, my name is uh, Jade. Um, I've started a small consultancy called um, Consulting Possibility. And I'm really inspired by the panel. Thank you so much for all of your insights. Um, my question is around mentorship. I think that um, many small business owners struggle with having someone to bounce things off of ideas and and um, big decisions that you that you need to make. And they might not be um, big decisions to the next person, but in your business, even the smallest thing can feel like a, a big decision and you need to bounce it off someone or just get some advice. And what, what do you think that it takes to, um, to, to select, uh, what, what should I be looking for in, in, um, in, in a mentor? Um, the kind of person to, to take this journey with me and what sort of environment do I need to be putting myself in to find someone like this? Um, any insights on your experiences with mentors? I know that you probably have uh, attached yourself to a few good people along the way. Um, yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Okay. Another question. My name is Nkleen Damase and my question is very brief. I'd like to know how do you handle the issue of women disempowering, you know, each other? Where else you expect to be supported by women, but then, you know, on the contrary, they're the ones to put you down because we all know there's what we call the pull her down syndrome. So, yes, I'd like to know how to handle that issue. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'll ask the panelists to take those three questions. I think this one you can ask you can answer Jackie's question first because she pointed you out. Okay. So I think this is the second question. Yes, the second question. So um Jackie, is it Jackie? Okay. Um how do you control your energy? Let me start by saying you, you are a human being. You have emotions. Um, you will have anxiety. You will panic. And that will display itself in many ways. You will cry sometimes. Sometimes we'll just get stuck. But you need to understand how do you respond to different types of pressure. So you, as you go, you'll pick up that, oops, if I have to present to this management committee, I don't remember what I had prepared or something like that, you panic. Learn to actually write your notes and learn to read your notes. Because when you, if you know that you are an anxious person who is highly emotional, chances are you forget what you had written. 
So learn to read what you have read, written. It takes nothing away from you. And secondly, it's okay to cry. There's, if there's one person who cries, it's me. I cry all the time. I leave that office at night sometimes having been pissed off by many people and I cry, I cry until I go to Patton Island when I get home, I put on makeup as if, and then they can see that I was crying and I cry more. <laughs> so it, it, you will be, you know, it's a difficult time. We li we're working in, an, in a very, very difficult time in South Africa where you get offended by just being who you are without even looking at what you do. But cry, wipe your tears, but don't cry in front of them. Don't cry in front of them. Cry when you're done and you're driving home or you're going, oh, just cry when they're not there and cry. Or even, you know, one of my mentors talking about mentorship, used to say that, you know what? I used to plan my Fridays for my tears. Again, it goes to decision. <laughs> Um, she's a beautiful woman. Her name is Zella Fope. She is something else. She says she used to plan her tears for Friday and cry, 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 cry for all. And she'll remember everyone who has, you know, offended her over the week. And and on Monday, she is back with a vengeance. And she's powerful. And you know, you, you will learn your little tricks. And also what is important, um, again, I'm, 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 I believe that we are human beings and we are, we need to center ourselves and ground ourselves. And when you do that and center yourself and ground yourself, you can only do that through the one person who knows your manual. And the one person who's got your manual is God. Whoever God is to you, your higher maker, your higher being, that person, when you talk to them, I don't know, for some reason, they bring magic in terms of your calmness and in terms of how you firmly ground yourself and center your energies around yourself and you become even a better person. And again, one last tip. Before you go to a meeting, take 10 minutes in the bathroom with your paper, talk to your maker and you walk there, you'll be somebody else. In fact, that's what I did as well. I locked myself in the wheelchair toilet. <laughs> and I talked to my maker. <laughs> um, there was a question on mentorship. Um, I think my attempt to answer that question is, um, I think just knowing what you need I think we confuse sometimes the difference between a mentor and a coach, and sometimes even a coach and a life coach. So there's a coach that coaches you in a different context, and there's a life coach. Just a quick example, um, there was a moment in my career, um, I think about two years ago, where we've got coaches all over the show at work, and I was like to my boss, I need a coach, and it's like, their coaches go to them and I've tried one and it didn't work out you know and I knew I didn't need a psychologist uh, I needed until I found myself a life coach um, that served exactly my purpose so one of the things you need to do before you sign up with any mentor coach or life coach is just do an intro session to make sure that the two of you get and connect each other and we know what we need. I always laugh at the number of friends I have. And when I am down and I don't need somebody to tell me to get over myself, I know which friend to, tell, to go to. No zip is going to say, no, yes, Nzi, please. And that's what I need that day. And if I need somebody who's going to say, what? No, man, like, let's go out and whatever. I know which friend I'm going to go to. <laughs> so we, we need to know what, I think the theme of this conversation has always been know yourself. Know what you need and, and, and also need know what you need to hear. I've got somebody else and I know I share that person with somebody in the audience. Somebody else in my life when I go to her with my issues. She's some kind of a coach to me. I must just be ready to hear what I don't want to hear. 
So j j just even in business, no, are you looking for somebody in the sector to help you navigate the sector? Is it personal life coaching that you need that has got to do has got nothing to do with business? And by the way, when you do life coaching, it helps you as a parent, as a wife, as a, in all your roles. It should help in your own. So you need to decide what you want. Just to touch on the question on energy, um, I've also cried, uh, Unati. I think the most beautiful thing about women is uh, being in touch with who we are generally, and I'm generalizing, and I always feel sorry for men. You, have you seen a man that wants to cry and that can't, can't cry? And I, I've taught colleagues how to cry, men colleagues, and they love it. And I'm like, okay, you're allowed to come in my office and cry. You know that? And they say, yes, I know. Oh, it's like, oh, sweet. Um, so there's a 10 second rule that works that just gives you a quick sense of, am I going to let it rip and cry? Or I can't cry here, there's too much at stake, kind of thing, and you collect yourself. There's nothing wrong with postponing your opinion. You feel a, a bit of whatever and you say, you know what, actually, I'll give you an answer to this, not today. Because you've done the 10 second thing. And if you go there and cry, cry, I've cried. Um, and 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 you need to also understand. For example, I've come to a, 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 to understand that when I've cried, I only cry out of disgust. Like I, when I'm really disgusted. Like I think you will see that she's she's so disgusted. I'm not crying because you've hurt me. Why must I give you that power? Oh my. But I'm actually disgusted, and my body just can't handle. You know, so again, know yourself, apply the 10 second rule, make a decision. The women disempowering thing, each other, it's a sad one. Uh, it's really a sad, a sad one, and that's when I believe we all need to be, to learn to be mentors to each other or coaches to each other. Because when you feel a woman um, that's supposed to support you is disempowering you in whatever way, know that you, it, for me, when somebody does that, I feel for that person more than me. So develop a, a way of seeing through what you deem to be disempowerment. And most of the time, those people are feeling insecure and sometimes they're struggling with the power you possess, but they don't know what they're struggling with. They're feeling this thing about you, but they don't know how to deal with it. It's always about them. And I want to say to you, when, so when you feel somebody has disempowered you, you've got a responsibility to empower that person. Because actually she's the one having a problem. She, she's the one challenged. It happens, see through them. They're insecure, they, they don't like you, probably competition to them, you know, do whatever, pray about it or whatever and go back and say, you know that when that happened that day, what did it do for you, my sister? You know, when you said this and this and this to me, what did it do for you? Maybe let's park what it did to me but what did it do for you? And let's talk about that. And I think in, in Zander's uh, advice to Unati, um, empowering each other, that's the best place to empower each other when somebody is feeling he's got the right to disempower you and don't be disempowered by another woman. I think my colleagues have already covered in extensively what has been asked, but just to add on to the mentorship part, um, in business especially, um, remember you, you need to also define for yourself what is, what is it that you are looking for. I normally say that you are not going to have a mentor that you, don't, you actually cannot connect with because first of all, um, if, you, if you drink and smoke, you can never have a mentor that doesn't drink and smoke. You know, because 
at some point you need to go and play together to be able because your business coaching and all all the things that you need might not necessarily happen in the boardroom or in a formal setting you know sometimes you might actually have to share with this person to a meeting and if you are traveling in one car and you smoke in your car and you get a person like me that's allergic to cigarette, then it's a problem. So again, do build those boundaries and say, what exactly is it that I want from this person? Again, do you, do you just want, you know, and if you also want just the sounding board, you know, build that relationship with a person where you know that, you know what, here I'm just going to be cold calling and say, How, what do I do with this? You know, there are those people that, as, as, as my colleagues have said, they're not going to boot about the bush and they're going to tell you walk away, do this or don't. You know, so you, you then need to then also know what it is that you want from people and also don't go to a doctor to want to know about cars, you know. Go to, a, go to a doctor and tell them where you feel the pain and the mechanic for the car problem. Because if you come to me and start telling me about tire pressures, I look at you and I'm like, every time I get to the garage, they ask me and I, I just show them at the door that that's what you need to do, you know? So again, make sure that you, you match what, what you're looking for. The disempowering issues, you know, we normally say that, and I know we, we, we always want to believe that all women empower other women. Some people just love being, I'm the first black, I'm the first woman, I'm the first dead, you know, and it's an ego trip. Again, you need to then say to yourself, where, where has this person been in life? You know, because once you start understanding them, you actually come and find that you can deal better with them than becoming what they are. Because I normally say that when you're faced with such a thing, don't become who you are not. Don't stoop to people's level and don't let, don't let people define you, you know? So be the better person. When you find that, be the better person and say, you know what, actually I thought I was going to be empowered, but the role has changed. I'm going to empower you. Wow. Can you clap for them? Just one last one, and I'm going to be very brief here. Um, I want to agree with my colleagues here. Um, Lerato, it's important. That rapport between you and Omento, it's number one. Um, have similar journeys, have similar professional um, aspirations. Most, even, most importantly, it's also the kind of family life that you guys share. Um, I've had great mentors in my life, and um, and I've, I've I've had one particular one whom I think I've become her because we shared so much in common. Um, and then the PhD syndrome, it's 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 it's, it's as simple as you know in course, Ilanga looks it. You know, it's when that person, when your sign shines so bright that it blinds them, that they will actually want to pull you down. Sometimes you just don't want to do anything. You just want to need to change your direction so that your son becomes her shade and walk away. Um, and uh, sometimes I know, Zinzi, there are some people that you want to make your projects to actually understand what is there, but sometimes you don't need that. Sometimes you just need to say, you know what, one day you will grow and understand. And, and those things happen in a very short space of time. Thing, things turn around. So I, I tend to have that big suitcase. If it's heavy, I drop it and I do my own thing. And one day people will grow. We cannot be super women. One last thing before I go, talking about super women. For every successful woman, you need to be able to take care, reflect, and look at this person who is yourself. Nature yourself. Look after your health. Don't postpone those um, doctor's appointments for your gynecological appointments, dental appointments, all those things. Look after yourself. I've seen so many women that are trying to be super women going out there, being the most powerful people, and then in no time they crumble and they lie 
in that small hospital bed that is not even in their houses and begging for their life. Sure. And some of them we have buried as young and as bright and as dynamic as they were. So make sure that you pace yourself and you know what you want, you will be successful. Sure. Wow, that was amazing. Um, and because of time, I'm going to have to close it. But I thoroughly enjoyed these ladies. I enjoyed their minds. They took us from the boardroom to the kitchen and to the mind, the soul, and the spirit. And it was just amazing. And I really do think everyone here, even the men that are around us, they are empowered. And I think we will leave knowing that we are not victims and certainly not victims of other people. We have within us to empower ourselves and so by empowering other people. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, guys. To recognize that bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting the next person to die. It is a parasite that is withholding the advancement of Africa as a continent. And we need to awake to the idea that Africa needs the woman of today. We are a generation that is being called to disrupt and change what has always been there. We carry as a woman of today a responsibility to build a home, a responsibility to raise children that will, we are preparing for the next generation. We cannot afford to contaminate our children with our hate for blacks, for whites, for Indians, for the next person. And we need to recognize that what was passed on to us we cannot hand the same thing to the next generation if we care about the reconstruction of Africa as a continent. The time has come for us as career uh, people. If you want the art of mastering your career, is the art of mastering your heart. You master your heart, you master who you are when nobody else is looking. You master identifying your insecurities because insecurity is a virus that is contaminating Africa and keeping people imprisoned into certain positions. Because the moment you stand in a position of security, you are able to allow others to shine, to move the spotlight to them. And insecurity is a very real feeling. It's a very real feeling. And if there's one thing about me, it's like I've been given such a level of understanding and compassion for the real feeling that the person is going through. If you are going through insecurity, it's a real feeling. But my call today as a career woman of today to master your career, deal with that research, find how to get to a place of security. Because holding in that position for people not to come near you, you are actually holding your own progress. Because it's only when you move to the next level that others can move up. 
We must master our careers by understanding our call, God's call for your life by understanding what it is that is your gifting that you can do naturally and strategically align that with the strategic imperatives of the organization that you are working for so that at the end of the day there is a mutual benefit in this partnering. You partnering with the organization to fulfill certain goals. And if you are finding that for the last five years you've been saying, I'm not happy in my job, this is not what I'm supposed to do. We, what we are going through is a result of the choices that you have made. Make a choice, take the decision, put together your exit strategy if you are not happy currently and you have not been happy for a long time. And just in closing, I would like to say as a person who's an entrepreneur and as a big advocate for business, because business is our key to poverty alleviation. The sad part is that the business People who are supposed to be establishing and creating employment are sitting in the jobs that they studied for, which is what they hate. But because now you are locked in to that uh, vicious cycle of having done and studied what you didn't like, having to get a job in order to pay your rent, and having to stay so that you can pay your kids' education. So it's now the last 10, 15 years of unhappiness. Exit strategy. The enemy is so strategic. Satan is strategic to hold, but we aren't good at planning, strategizing, implementing, and delivering. But what we do is that we even get to a point of using prayer for those who are spiritual to wait and praying and praying. And God answered long time ago. And God has been telling you, you are not happy in this job and you have acknowledged it, but you are still in the job and it's 10 years down the line. <laughs> Mastering your career is mastering yourself, mastering your choices, mastering your decisions, and above everything, mastering your joy, because women are tone setters. When we are joyful, when we are happy, the environment at home is happy, the environment at the office is happy. We carry the power to take Africa forward, but we don't even realize it. Thank you. Um, is this working? Yeah, thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I do quite a lot of public speaking and it's not a lot of times that I'm left without words. So I think everything has been said um, and in an extremely moving and professional way. Um, if I can add to that, I think one of, uh, so firstly, as I drove in, I have to say that as a woman and as an entrepreneur, it was amazing driving in here because over 20 years ago, I started a small company that I thought was going to change the world, which never did, which is why I'm here now doing this thing. Um, but this was a huge, huge factory selling um, big, 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 huge rolls of fabric. And I came here with my one child on my arm and my other child on my back, being absolutely tiny, um, and buying white flannelette. So I was one of the first people that made uh, something that looked like a throwaway nappy, but it's actually made of flannel. So it's environmentally friendly and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so it was a very beautiful round trip for me to come right here, which looked extremely different 20 years ago. Um, the theme here, uh, starting with what art and mastering is, what comes before art and mastering, and you've touched on that in the beginning and an end point, is the word permission. And I'm saying that specifically because we're 99% females in the house. Females do still not earn 70% of what males earn, no matter how successful they are. There is no parity of pay. You've got to work twice as hard to be considered half as good. 
And if that is hard, if it's even harder if you're colored and it's even harder if you're black. So thank you for bringing that black voice um, into, into, the, into the venue of, of, of saying it for what it is. So I want to start today by saying you can't master any art <laughs> of any career if you don't give yourself the permission to do that. Once the permission is given to yourself, the door opens and things happen. So from where I'm standing, I think there are three things that you need to look at if you want to master your career. And none of this I knew, so I wasn't 22 years old and planned my career with the art of mastery. I kind of bumbled into it where I am today. But if I join the dots backwards and I can give advice forwards, People will always tell you, if you ask them about their career, they will tell you one of three things. They will tell you the passion, talent kind of story. You know, that's what I'm passionate about. Or they will tell you the competence type story. I studied to be a lawyer. Or they will give you this, oh, you know, um, I really want to do this good thing in the world and, and therefore um, it's not about the money. It's never about the money. But how is it not about the money, dudes? Huh? Where did that one come from that it's not about the money? Um, so, so I want to take those three things and I want to point to a projection of telling you it is all three things. It is how do you marry, for those of you who've studied mathematics, if you draw a line here and a line there and a line there, where do they intersect? That is your career. And if you give yourself the permission to unlock that, you're sorted. So let's just quickly pause on passion. Another word, I think we know what passion is, right? And another word for passion is talent. You're really good at mathematics, or you're good at art, or you're good at interior decorating, or you've got a way with people and empathy, whatever it is. There's an obvious talent that you have. But not everybody has passion. And you feel really stupid when people ask you what's your passion, and you think, oh, surely I'm going to know one day. <laughs> or you don't have a particular talent. But there is something that's very beautiful about those two words, and that is the word that I call vision. And it's a very easy word. It's what you do when you close your eyes. What do you see? So in those years when I was going to you know, change the world with making flannelette nappies, um, I visioned a building with, with kind of my name on, not my, the ego person, but the brand, like Cornerstone on this building. And without knowing it today, there is a building. It's got Siba's name on. And I'm the CEO, and I'm the co-founder of that. So vision, yes strategy. If you're clever enough <laughs> and smart enough and you give yourself permission. But vision is when you close your eyes and you see, what do I see? And be loose with yourself. Is it a building that you see? Is it certain clothes that you see? Do you see, see yourself standing up on the podium in front of a microphone? Just general visions. Take a storybook, cut things out of magazines, pluck it in. Ask yourself, what does that thing nebulously look like? And start living into that even though you don't know that. That said, back to her position and yours going to, to City Varsity, you got to know stuff. You can't just be cool and visionary. You've got to know stuff. You have to be competent in what you do. So if you're into law, or you're into fashion, or you're into CA, or you're a mathematician, doesn't, or education, doesn't matter what it is, you have to be competent. And for that, your story about hiding secrets in a book that brought tears to my eyes. How dare we not have the permission to open a book? Nelson Mandela, in his Long Walk to Freedom, speaks of the difference in cultural upbringings, where in his upbringing it was not celebrated to ask questions. Really? That's how children grow up, is by asking questions. So go and learn, go and study, be clear on what it is that you want to do, and be competent. And the third thing, and I'm going to be very unpopular for saying that, but I am going to say that, and that is I'm going to paraphrase it and explain what I mean, but chase the money. Okay. <laughs> because we're always supposed to say it's not about the money, and it's not really about this, and it's not really about that, and it's not really about anything. Right? People want you to work 80 hours a week, and it's not really about the money you should do, because your heart is in it, but who else drives that car? <laughs> what I mean by chase the money is a very broad thing that says the world we live in is an economic world. 
It's an economic world that is the currency in which we survive. We are not species that survive on our own. Right? You can go into a felt and you can see an elephant walk off into the distance and he's okay because he can munch a tree tonight. We cannot do that. We're a collective species. None of you here invented the microwave or the electricity or bottled that water. We live collectively of each other in an economic world. If you're part of an economic world, and my organization is a not-for-profit, because it's not about the money, of course it is about the money. If somebody doesn't put a million rand in our bank account, we can't pay salaries. So understand and be okay back to permission that you're in an economic world that chases supply and demand. That's our survival as a species. That's in our DNA. And my last point, so you've got to go for the passion vision thing, you've got to go for the competence thing, you've got to go for the economic thing. The thing that holds that together, which both of us, uh, both of you have spoken about, is the person, the self, the confidence, the permission. At CBA, we call that leadership. And leadership is not your president. Leadership is you. Who am I? If you can lead yourself, and you can lead yourself, and you and you and you, and we can all lead ourselves, I can promise you it's going to be in the right direction. So start with self-leadership, and self-leadership as a woman starts with permission. In that is your voice in the organization. And I know the word disruption is a really cool word nowadays, and it's a true word, but it's a sharp knife that can alienate. It can also open a door. It can pick a lock, that sharp knife. So years ago, I bumped into L.B. Sachs and I asked him, what do you do if you're, in a, if you're in a company and people make offensive remarks, politically offensive remarks, which to me happens a lot because I'm white and I'm Afrikaans, so people just assume that they can make remarks in my company that's okay, which is not okay. But if you speak up, you alienate people and all they do is they say, next time don't speak in front of her. <laughs> so you've achieved nothing. But L.B. Sachs, who I bumped into one day and asked that question, he says you have a duty to speak up. So as women, we have a duty to speak up. If you speak up too loudly, People will just alienate you and cut you off and your voice won't be heard. And that is the leadership. How do I say what I need to say in order to be heard? That builds who you are as a person. And that builds your position in your company. And that builds your career. And I think that is the art of mastering. Thank you. Um, thank you to you guys. Um, I think the, the platform has been set. Um, I'm, I'm very out there, so I'm just going to keep it very informal and I want us to engage. So I'm going to keep sitting if that's okay with everybody. And I want you guys to lean in. So they've taken their time to sit here, impart their knowledge, and this is the time to lean in and make it about you. We've all spoken to the fact that the career starts with you. Give yourself permission to ask that question. Have the confidence to, to knock on that insecurity inside you and say, you know what, I'm done with you. Okay, just a little bit about me and insecurity and permission. I'm scared right now. <laughs> right now, I'm nervous and it doesn't come naturally to sit here and, and to speak to you guys. But uh, I am spiritual, so I pray about it. And as I'm sitting here, I'm like, thank you, God, for your grace and mercy, and I can do this. <laughs> so, so do it. Do it and take this opportunity now that I'm going to present to ask the questions and let's our, let our panelists answer, and other things will be unpacked. And then maybe someone, someone next to you might come out of the session with something, and you say, what? Um, I'm not sure where my career is going, but I'm going to start mastering. You can start mastering. Master the fact, master you, because I said in the beginning, you are your competitive advantage. So the more you master you, the more you draw the path of your career, and the more it will become clear. But it will never be clear if you haven't started unpacking yourself. So on that note, I'm going to open up the floor to any questions to our panelists. There's a hand. So I'm going to take a set of about. 
um, let's say three, because we've got three hands, and then after that we'll do another round and we'll let the panelists answer the first three. So it'll be lady at the front, second lady with the red jacket, and then third one over there. I don't know if I have a roaming mic. Okay, fourth one, so we'll do four in this session, okay? Um, do we have a roaming mic? Yes. Here, at the front. So I'd like you to please stand up and proudly say who you are, say you're a fantastic woman and you've got a great question, and then we'll kick off. <laughs> I know that is easy for me to just say how awesome I am. I'm NC uh, from Terato Holdings. I think what, what I'm interested in, in I've, I've just listened to your biography, Nomzamo. I think we, we need a lot out of you. We've, you've got a good uh, record. How did you master your art in, 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 in this industry? It could have been anyone. What did you do to get where you are? Because it is heavy out there. And uh, how did you get there? More than that, it's, 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 I, I really am excited about the other speakers. You, you said it well. Yeah. It, it, it's all about starting with self. And what excites me is that how did you navigate through for yourself to be where you are today. All righty. You know what? You, I'm going to sound like I'm selling my age now because you're wanting me to talk about how many years you know I've been doing what I've been doing and, and all of that. I, I might as well say it. I'm 54. So yes, I only 54. Okay, so now uh, your question, I think there's a lot to unpack. Unfortunately, don't have that much time to do it. However, though, I think our journeys, each one of us sitting in this room, has been pre-planned for us. That's what we need to understand, first of all. The family that I'm coming in, the family that you are born in, it's not a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. The reason I'm saying that, I'm born in a house where I'm the firstborn with four brothers and a late sister, late Lamaki in Africans. <laughs> so I grew up and, and I had my grandfather in the house, I had my dad. I grew up around a lot of men. And there was a reason for that, because my path ended up in the career that I am in corporate world where majority, in fact, I become the only woman in that boardroom amongst men. And I'm lucky this time we are two. So look at that pattern because I was brought up in a house with so many men being the only girl and then later my sister in life. But be as it may, I'm not going to get into that, but all I don't want you to lose is who you are, where you're coming from, because that tends to shape your kind of the way you, where you're going. So don't lose that. God didn't make a mistake about where you're coming from, but be as it may, my career, when she said she started as a receptionist, I was like, yo, that was smart. I started as a domestic worker. I started as a domestic worker, working three days a month and earning my salary at the end of the month. Who can take a guess here how much I was earning per month? Yo, that was a lot. I was earning 68 rand, 55 cents. I even know it. So what I'm saying is, from that time I was determined, I knew that I wanted to be something different. This is not what it is for me. And I needed to work at the time because my dad was in prison. My mom was a, an executive, that's what we call them these days, but at that time, we know most how our moms were called. That's what she was. She raised so many kids. Like I said, we were six at home. When my dad, went, my dad went into prison, I knew I needed to help at home. So I then worked, and then I was doing smaller also kind of uh, jobs here and there, selling clothes. Um, whenever there's an opportunity where I see chips and everything, I was selling everything. I was an entrepreneur at my age at that time. So as I was doing this, uh, then I realized I wanted to continue the only way out of here. I'm born, by the way, in Nyanga East. 
We know Manyanga East, guys. Cape Flats, you know what's happening. So I grew up in Nyanga East. I knew that for me, this is not what it is. And if I escape it, I will escape it with my family. I will take all of my family out with me. So given that then I went to study at UWC, I studied honors and all of that, I didn't know at the time that my career will end up in human resources. A career is like a tree, guys, you know? So it grows into certain directions, but you land in the right place because you have to be there to learn. Again, it's not a mistake where you're at. So when I started my career, let me say this, um, for some reason from university years already, there will be people who show an interest in you when they see that you really want to succeed. When they see how determined, how focused you are, that vision you were talking about, everyone wants to help. However, though, as we all know, there will be those that won't have you know, those good intentions on you. But they are brought to your life also for a reason, for you to learn and adjust. No pain, no gain. No gain. So there are some people who are supposed to teach you along the way to push your butt for you to move on. So when I, I entered the, my career, uh, it was at um, Pamela these days, which was Bonita Dairy Products at the time, and I started as a recruitment officer. And it's a very African environment. The people at the level at the time, you know, um, um, we call our, our own people, what you call it, migration labor. I feel like I don't want to say these words, but that was what it was. So I came in to help recruit. Now the challenge was some were not speaking English <laughs> when. So, yeah, so now I needed to be that conduit to play more than that role. So, in there, that's when you experience appetite. That's at that time it was still rife, remember? It was still rife. Where you are seen, but not seen. Yeah. Your, your pair of hands is needed, but actually not your brains. But you are needed anyway because you need to facilitate you know, these conversations. But be as it may, my brothers and I, I will say please don't be, um, my brother, sister, please don't be offended. At the time the unions became my brothers because I needed to help them out from the situation that they were in, where in terms of the salary, what they were earning and all of those. I ended up playing a bias role. But then I realized I'm, I'm wearing a different hat now. I'm becoming a union, union member, a shop steward, whatever, but that's not what I wanted there to be there. So ladies, it's important not to lose your focus. Because sometimes you get emotionally involved in situations which, which takes us away from our agenda. So from there, I then learned the hard way, but I had to move because I've realized I became so subjective. I then looked for another job because I, I couldn't get out of it now because I wasn't it. There was an expectation I've created for my people. So I was not looking at the organization. I was serving a certain purpose. So I moved on. Moving on into an, another environment, I went in there realizing that I needed to learn something. I needed to ask myself questions. What is it that I want? Why am I in these careers? Yes, I am so driven, but I don't understand what it is that I'm doing. Why am I driven? Now that journey then started because I needed to be true to myself in terms of what exactly do I want to be. Then I, I had a taste of HR. Then I realized there is a path for me here to be an HR person. But at the time, my vision was up to a, wanting to be a manager, not beyond that. Then I started putting the short-term plans, which as we all know, short-term plans leads to longer-term plans. So I started putting those plans in place. Now, as I do that, I had to learn 
the mastery of adversity. Where then you, as you learn to do what you have to do, looking at people as role models, having to learn with other cultures, you know, because you're a, this uh, corporate is, is a very different environment. I was learning the hard way. It was tough, and in most environments, like I said, I became the only black person in that department. So I needed to find me in that. And learning to do that, it's, it's, it's difficult. Because through adversity, you then start understanding your own core values, your core beliefs. Who are you? I am black. I'm proud of it. Oh, it's a nice skin color, right? <laughs> so that's what I am. But I started looking at other people around me to say that God created it, all of us. We are using our skin colors against one another, which stands in the way of us learning from each other. And I realized that's not what I'm going to be all about. Then I started associating, trying to understand why the other person doesn't like me. What is it? And then I started making relationships. And then I started making my inroads. But by the way, it was not only about the relationships and understanding me. Yeah. Because then I've now developed resilience, remember? And there was a bit of confidence. Now I needed to layer and build onto this confidence more. But how do I do that? It was about taking risks, putting my hand up to do things in an organization knowing that I'm going against the odds. I needed to study more. I needed to read. I needed to prepare. I needed to excel in what I do and be the best that I can be. That's out how it happened. But in that boardroom, what we need not to lose as women is we are unique. God created us you know, in that way. Don't change to be something that you're not. People must experience you for who you are and accept you as such. <laughs> Whilst you apply yourself in the role and contributing meaningfully in the role. Now in any business, when in, in the boardroom, you've got to contribute towards the business. As much as you are applying yourself and trying to help others with the, you know, in terms of the side of us as women where we nurture, sometimes we lead from the back, we lead from the front. That's what I, I'm using, the qualities of a woman of who I am. Nothing, you know, different. But all I do know is that it's important to know your subject matter. Be the expert and you must contribute meaningfully in that boardroom. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm just going to give Andre five seconds. Um, we have to excuse her for a bit. Um, just to have any closing remarks, if you want. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm really sorry that I do have to go. Um, unfortunately, I had a prior commitment, so I said I could stay until two, so thank you for that. Um, no particular um, closing comment other than just to really, as these questions are being answered, to really honor, um, honor the journey of that person, because it's, it sounds really simple to say, I was ignored and not seen, and what did you do? And the cumulative effect of that to see successful people today is extremely expire, inspiring. So thank you very much for having me. And I'm sorry I have to go. All right. Thank you, Andre. Okay. Okay. We'll continue now with the questions. Thank you. My name is Mandy and I have a company, Freedom 44. Um, I want to first of all acknowledge our current speakers and our previous speakers for speaking about their children. They are so much a part of our lives and when we hear these panels discussions it's really helpful. It sort of makes it okay for all of us to do that, so thank you. Um, I run a course, one of the courses I run is called Career Crossroads and it's helping people to make conscious choices about their career rather than being pulled by the nose and circumstance as we sometimes are. And so I'm keen to hear from you, and it's in some way covered, but I'm keen to hear in more detail 
how did you know almost in your body that you needed to make a choice and make a change? And then you've spoken about some of the ch conscious choices you've already made, but what perhaps was your most recent one? And what stirred it? And then of course, Vuyo, I'm very keen to hear about your new choice. <laughs> Thank you. I would like you to repeat slowly your questions. Yeah. I didn't hear all of them. Let's go slowly. How do you know when you needed to make a choice or a change? How do you know in your body? Or, and what's your most recent choice or change you needed to make? Okay. I think it will differ, you know, for, for all of us sitting, uh, you know, uh, here in this room. Um, if I were to look at a recent choice that I have made, hmm, there's a lot. Uh, they, they keep happening every day, by the way. Um, the, the recent choice that I had to make is now I've told myself my journey is finished at Glacier. Oh, this is a secret, by the way. <laughs> Please, no one knows. It's a, it's a secret, it's a secret. And how did that came about? I kept on, for some reason, when I joined Glacier, I joined Glacier at the time that I was going through a lot of, of um, uh, uh, going through a lot at the time. My son had just passed um, tragedy, and I was based in Johannesburg at the time, and it happened here in Cape Town. And, uh, and I was running my business, but I lost interest completely. I wanted to be back home. At that time, as I was thinking about coming back home, and then Glacia was looking for me, the exit the executive search uh, approach me again, things happened for a reason. And, and I landed at Glacier. When I got to Glacier, I was like, I'm going to be there for two years, not more. Um, I'm seven years now at Glacier. <laughs> Uh, where, and it was, for me, at the time, it was a small organization, 200 people who are now six, almost 600. I then thought, you know, it's small because I'm used to running big things like, you know, where I'll be responsible for 14, 16,000 people and all of those. But it was a matter of dealing with me at the time because I was going through a lot. I would say there was turmoil within me. Um, which then, at that time, my relationship with God deepened because I was trying to understand what happened here. How do you live with this when you lose your own? Yes, I've lost my brother before. I've lost so many people, but not of my own. And in the manner that it happened, um, um, it was a train accident. And it was his first time to get into a train. He got into a train because Okay, now as he got into the train, he missed to hold that pole and he fell in and that was it. But then we needed to understand that, to have closure as a family. Why all of a sudden you go there? Because he is never, I mean, you know, our kids nowadays, you take them to school up until they are at university, yes. But that, it had to happen, but be as it may. So I was like, at Glacier, I'll be two years. When I got to Glacier, Glacier is, it, uh, uh, there's a lot of people who are academics because if a financial industry, you deal with actuarials and accounting. People are very smart with PhDs and all. Now, wherever I worked, I'm known to have a working formula. I get in there, I sort this out in two years, I can see it's turning, but not with Glacier. That was not happening. The more I tried this, it was not working. As I tried this, it was not, because these people were too smart. <laughs> and they were so curious, they knew everything about HR, so now what? <laughs> so there's part of me that felt vulnerable and inadequate and incompetent. I wanted to run away. And then I said to the CEO, um, Anton, you know what, I think 
you got the wrong person for this role. Um, I, let me, I, I don't want to be here. He said to think about it, Nomzamo. Please don't do this. I'm giving you the whole weekend to go and, and think. Came back, but, but let's talk about the reflection now, the weekend. Now I'm scared to go back because <laughs> these people are challenging and they want you know, each and every piece of me. You know, turn this corner, they, they know this, they want that. I couldn't handle it. Um, then over the weekend, self-introspection, I realized that actually something has to change about me. There are certain things that I have to unlearn and relearn. I have to acknowledge that I'm not used to this, therefore I need to do something about it. Yes, I've learned the art you know, of the trade. It doesn't mean it's not there. It's my, in my application, how am I going to apply it differently so that I add value into their lives? I went back on Monday, on Tuesday. Then Anton sat with me and I could see he thought I was going to give him that resignation letter. I said, no, I've decided to stay. He looked at me. I said, on condition, you and I, we partner. I am so vulnerable right now. I know that I can make it work, but I need you to hold hands with me. And then he said in return to me, Nomzam, you're offering something that we don't have. That is why we wanted you. You are the voice of reason. We also don't know how to handle that about you. So let's hold hands. The rest is history. Now, seven years later, Anton is retiring. I said to him at the time, I won't leave anymore. He said, please leave when I retire. I said, I take your word for it. <laughs> now it's his last year. And guess what? It's not about that. I've realized I have done everything that I had to do. At Glacier, my journey is finished. I can feel it in me that it's time for me to go. I'm not pushed by anyone, but I do know I've got to go somewhere where I don't know, I don't have a clue. <laughs> but it's time to go. Here, it's here. I haven't done much changing. <laughs> no, 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 okay. I don't have experience in changing organizations because I've been with the same organizations for 16 years until last month. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think to capitalize on the time that we have today, um, also because you are here to listen to, to, to be able to take something. I think if I were to just share some of the things that I've observed um, in the marketplace, which are quite critical for us at this time and in this season as individuals, as women who care about our journeys and where we are going, because it's the reason you are here today. Um, it is that in that season that you are planted in the organization that you are planted in or in your business where you are doing whatever you are doing, as uncomfortable as it can be sometimes, but your sanity, your wellness is the highest priority. It means that whilst you are unable to immediately jump from the situation that you find yourself in, is to identify what you have to offer that the organization benefits from. Because I noticed that when, as an individual, you, when you add value to something, it does something for you psychologically, emotionally, when you are adding value, when you are making a difference, and when you are, yeah, when you are making a change and a contribution. So I think the most important thing is to be alert and be aware of what you are thinking about. And I think this one has been one of the um, 
most powerful tools that I have used in my journey in the last 16 years to be alert and be aware of what you are thinking about. I always imagine my mind as a scale and you can observe over a period of a day or a week, just, uh, uh, just be alert about your mind, where you are thinking, where the scale is. Is it more on the negative most of the time? Is it more on the positive? most of the time. And I find that as they say that your attitude determines your altitude. Then you recognize that, no man, my, my thinking scale is, um, is more this way for a long time. And it can be a downward spiral. And you can go more and more into the negative and which is unhealthy for you. Um, so it's really to, uh, I would say that one of the tools and, 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 and um, principles that I've used is to be alert about what I'm thinking about and to do something about moving that scale back. And if it remains there for a long time, then you do something about it. That's where friends come in, that's where prayer comes in and all of that to move that scale back up to where, <laughs> to where it's supposed to be. So it's something that's really um, very important in the, uh, for us in the career space. And um, secondly, is um, to be able to uh, be a great team player in your partnership with the people that you work with. Choose to do the right thing. Just choose to do the right thing. Uh, sometimes you are always tested. Ne? I've seen the power of going with the opposite spirit. My journey has also not just been smooth from reception to CEO over there. <laughs> you know, it's like I didn't take a lift, <laughs> uh, a lift up. It's been a very hard, and one of the uh, seasons that I think I would like to share is the fact that our industry is very egotistic. You know, a person who's like, I'm the producer. Uh, you know, I'm the director. <laughs> Um, you know, it's like I am this. And I had a very, very challenging season where in my moves um, that I would, um, I would not spend too many years doing something to an extent that I had an identity crisis at some season, in one of the seasons, where I couldn't quite tell, am I a, am I a producer, am I a script writer, am I, what am I, because I'm everywhere where I'm needed. Uh, in a certain season of my journey. And then there was a time where it became painful because now I feel like, uh, yeah, it's like people just uh, don't respect you. It's like, go to all our film and television. It's like, so uh, what are you? You know, I'm like, oh, which cap am I wearing today? Uh, you know, in all of that journey. But I'll tell you what, and then in 20, uh, Yes, in 2010, when I became the general manager of the company, it was a testing opportunity. And as the board of Oklamidia was deciding who to herd the organization, guess what? The ability to understand every single role within the organization. The very same thing that was my pain for a number of years became my power because as a general manager, you know a little bit about everything. So sometimes we may not understand why we go through the things that we go through and it can be testing and challenging, but sometimes just holding on and trusting uh, can lead you to a place, because that position was never there and there was never going to, nobody knew it was going to be there, just to know how strategic God is, because he knew, even though in the hierarchy of the organization, nobody knew, and guess what, even some of the people that were undermining you in the process, um, you know, now they have to come and report to you, because now you are the head of everything. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, maybe yeah, I'll just I'll just uh, I'll just leave it there for now. Okay, we're going to take the last um, not the last two questions. We're going to take the remaining two questions and maybe another two more um, in the interest of time. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, I have two quick questions. Uh, one to Mam Nomzamo and one to Sis uh, Vuyo. Uh, my name is Sigelela Suseni and I own just a small little company called uh, Pigments. Um, to Mam Nomzamo, uh, sorry about the passing of 
Pasana. Um, I wanted to ask you, the, as millennials, the reality of, of our careers, we graduate at a very young age, and uh, when we get into the workplace, we're still trying to figure it out. We are caught between titles, we don't know where to go, and it becomes a jungle gym uh, while moving. But then, when it looks on your CV, you've been six months here, six months at another firm, and you've been moving around. How does that work? Um, does it work at your, um, on your advantage? And uh, does that affect your recruitment system? Because our we don't stay too long at jobs, yeah, <laughs> because we're still trying to figure it out. And then to Um Osis Voyo, I just want to know, how important is exposure in career choices? Because you came from the Transkai side and then coming to Big Lights, and how did you know that you wanted to do uh, broadcasting? Those are the two questions I have. Okay. You go first. Okay, um, I think it's quite true what you're saying about millennials, that um, in terms of their, <laughs> let me rather say, uh, Shelf life is very short. Um, but be as it may, remember we as organizations, we do also have look at our strategic objectives in terms of how we want to expand or grow this business. And we do take into cognizance the caliber of people that we're looking for now is very young. And young as it is, their needs are very different from our needs. And remember in the organization, there's still the baby boomers, which is us, so the age range varies. But we do know that we need you. In fact, my, the average age of my, my, my organization is 35. There's few of us dinosaurs, <laughs> but it's 35. So it's very young. We understand, we go and do research, and we we go and learn quite a lot about how to make this environment conducive to you guys and make you want to be here. And we always strive to keep talent, to retain. So we've got all those strategies in place. For example, in our environment, we don't have what to call a job description because you guys don't do well with job descriptions. The only thing is about what is it that you need, the input that is required and the output. How you do it, go and find out yourself how you want to do it. And then secondly, we also know that this role is, that is defined, you also get bought very quickly. We always do projects. You get involved in projects so that you get out of that and you do another one. That's how we, how, that's how we roll. So the environment is in that way so it so that young people can thrive so because of that very few live in our organization uh, we're very young I mean we do stuff that I mean I was telling Ulira to earlier on that I've got to go back to work now we've uh, we busy re-energizing re -energizing our culture but in a different way we've got a, a theater we're going to be acting out our our values of the organization so I'm part of that we've, we're doing it at Willow Bridge we are trained by, I mean, experts and all of that. I tell you, when we put up those things to say, we need actors, hey, the hands. And it, it, that's how we roll. I mean, we do all sorts of stuff to retain. But what we also know, unfortunately, our lady is not here. To keep a person is not only about salary. It's a holistic approach. You know, the well-being of the person has to be taken into cognizance in terms of what we offer. So we do that. We don't use your CV against you because, like I said, we acknowledge the fact that you're still looking for a home. You're trying to find you. So we are okay with that. As long as we can talk through when we interview you, we can help us understand what happened, why you moved, and where uh, that, that for us is sufficient. So I moved into broadcasting. I moved into broadcasting because I cared for people. Um, I cared. Um, to know that when people are listening, what they are consuming is something that is a deposit 
that adds value, whether it's from an information perspective or from um, or for empowering. As a, uh, for example, I started radio adversity uh, on campus, uh, but whilst you know when you are students, young partying and all of that, even though uh, the presenters would play music and it would be fun and all of that, but I, that I, I've always had that. I felt that responsibility in our, our community to use the power of radio to communicate something of value. So I would go to the uh, professors in the university, invite them to my show to share on certain topics to empower the people. So it was really, I was driven by um, the care for people and also to realize that what, when pe what people hear on radio is like gospel, <laughs> you know, and also I saw that being behind the scenes in broadcasting, you have a power to shape the whole nation, and you have the power to destroy the whole nation. Um, because what you put out as content, whether it's through a soapy a television program, or there is always an agenda. Whether it's an agenda to build a, an agenda, to destroy, and also there is a lot of manipulation. You can shape and change things because you have that power to be the last person to have it, to deliver it to the people. So that is why righteousness, ethics, integrity, truth, are powerful tools that are needed in the mountain of media in order to communicate the truth to report with integrity. And when you build entertainment content, to build an entertainment content like eating food, it depends what it is that you want your body to experience. You can eat healthy and all of that and the results will show. You can stuff yourself with anything and the results will show. It's the same with the consumption of television content. Whatever you pump yourself, whatever you eat, you let your eyes see, you let your ears hear. Remember, faith comes by hearing. No matter what it is though, that you are hearing, but whatever you are hearing, whether you are aware or not, it is busy shaping your psychology of something, of certain concepts. So um, I enjoy the power of using television to produce content that builds, that creates, and that adds value to society. Okay, I'm not going to be your favorite person. I'm going to be that guy who's going to be like, oh, I've got to, got to wrap it up. I've got to wrap it up. But um, all yeah. of you guys will be around for you to personally ask them and engage, and that will be open to everyone if you can just get. Unfortunate, unfortunately, in the interest of time, that's the sentence that you use when you're trying to wrap it up. Forgive me, ne? For, uh, uh, uh. One, I've got to keep to the time. My job here is to keep to the time. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, respectfully, respectfully I have to keep to the time and I have to wrap it up on that note. Please, please don't hate me too much. Um, but thank you so much to our speakers. Um, that was absolutely amazing. And I'm gonna hand over now to um, okay, I'm going to give them the praises first. Okay. Okay, I'd like to say thank you to all your guys in Hamzamo. Okay, cool. So now I'll call on to Ayanda, the BMF chairperson for the Century City branch, to come on stage and close us off.
So the program says that I'm supposed to summarize the various discussions, and that's a very daunting task. There was so much that was said. I feel like I should start writing like a short book on everything that was said today. So I'm not going to try and summarize all the various conversations. I think we all have something to take home, to think about, to ponder on, and use to master our careers and where we see ourselves going forward. So I won't try to summarize everything, but I'll just highlight a few things that stood out for me. And I think today, I had, coming here, I had quite a narrow-minded view of what empowerment meant. And I think today, we realized from each speaker that empowerment can mean various things. I mean, from Jane, I learned empowerment means to voice out your opinion, to not be silent, because silence is dangerous. And from Cindy, it's learn, learn, learn every day, to have that <clears throat> fund, <laughs> <laughs> and to build your personal reputation. And then from Zinzi, it's about watching your energy. You know, sometimes you don't have to fight every fight. Sometimes you might have to lose the battle in order to win the war. And with Unati, it was pace yourself. Being empowered is about making a psychological decision to be empowered. And from Nomzamo, it was having the creative touch. I mean, a job is a job is a job. But you've got to add your creative touch to it, what makes you unique. And people need to accept you for who you are because there's only one you in this world. To try and pretend to be someone else, you can never be better at being me, because only I can be me. And from Uvuyagazi, the art of mastering your career is the art of mastering your heart. That was very powerful and profound. And to Audrey, who unfortunately had to leave, I think I wanted to tell her that, you know what? I'm not shy to say I want to chase the money. I'm not even ashamed about it. <laughs> I think, you know, growing up and seeing the effects of apartheid on my parents, I said they gave me such great opportunities. It's my duty to give my kids a better lifestyle than the ones they were able to afford me. So yes, I will chase the money. And let's all chase the money. <laughs> and last but not least, this quote or line was amazing from Lerato Kildana, Uzoi Telaganjan, Ushele Konen. Translation, how are you going to progress sitting in the corner? And may you all take that and say, we are not going to sit in the corner. We are going to get out the corner, get out of our shells, step outside the box, and progress our careers. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And just to close off the event, I'd just like to call upon Utulani to come on stage and just say his vote of thanks before we close the session. Thank you. I, I stand here in awe of what happened today. And I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank the speakers. Uh, Sis Lirato Nyabonga, Sis Nomzan Nyabonga, Sis Vuyagazi Nyabonga. I've, I've, um, I hope what I envisioned for the day caught on to everyone. One of the, um, the thing was, there were two strong points to the objectives of today, which was to motivate and to empower. And I think Usis Unati kind of set the tone when she says, failure should be a doorway to doing something better. So um, we need to keep that never give up spirit. Um, another thing which, as an objective, was really the social capital aspect of it. And I think Uusis Sinzi summarized it well when she says, we have to connect. I would have used networking, but a lot of us come from cultures where you don't have the financial backing to sort of ride on certain projects. So social capital becomes something very solid, very strong, and I hope we continue to grow that capital. Um, Mrs. Fuyogazi said something that really caught my, my attention. It kind of hit me. Uguti, as we tell our stories, we must also let other people's stories dictate 
our lives. So it's, it's, it's stuff that, it's kind of a lift as you rise, translated into a more artistic way. Um, and like you said again, choose to do the right thing. That, that is something I think we all struggle with, you know. But um, again, on behalf of Cornerstone, on behalf of the BMF, um, I can do that. I straddle both worlds. <laughs> I would like to thank you all for, for attending today and hope you got something out of this. Yabo. Sorry, just as you go out, could you each one pick one of these up at the Cornerstone desk? It's just the programs that the Business Studies Department offers. Thank you. Go. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, just before we go off, um, Mrs. Vyoga he has asked if you could please indulge her. She would like to say a short prayer before everyone leaves. <laughs> Yeah, I just felt in my spirit to pray as, you, as, as everybody leaves. Father, we come before you today. We thank you for the gift of time. Thank you that we could sit under the anointing and the release of new directions to certain people, Lord. Thank you that um, in some hearts the lines were drawn to do things differently from today. We'd like to thank you, Lord, for Cornerstone Institute, for its uh, vision, for its mission, and for what it's achieving to society. I thank you that even today, there will be generations influenced by the decisions taken by some women in the room today. Thank you for a productive engagement. So we just speak just a spirit of blessing, a spirit of release, a spirit of direction, a spirit of confidence in who you have created, Lord. I just pray for each woman, Father, to stand strong in who you have called them to be, and that this is a season to rise, to be, and to be a blessing. And that Lord will just release just a spirit of unity, even in companies that are represented here today, Father. We pray that Lord, you will bless them. You will bless every woman that is here. You will touch each hand, Lord, in that which they are about to produce. Lord, I just pray that you will bless their seed, Lord, that it may be able to produce fruit that many would harvest from the gifts of women here today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.